Welcome back, everybody. We're back to our regularly scheduled program. Today's episode is actually the last one that I recorded before traveling with my wife and ending up in the emergency room. So it's a little bit delayed getting it out, but we're going to be able to get it out. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I was really trying to get people to forward think about their holiday gifts for the coffee lover in their life, and nothing's really changing about that. Let's go to the website and take a look at what they have to offer because there's always birthdays, there's always anniversaries, there's always a special occasion to get the coffee lover in your life, something coffee related. So if you go to blackrifflecoffee.com right now on their rotating banner, they're doing 15% off of coffee bundles. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you click on it, um, you have the opportunity to see the 2023 impact of your purchases and how that directly benefits the veteran community. I'm not going to click on it right now, but if you do click on that, that's going to lead you to another page with the YouTube video that really breaks down how Black Rifle Coffee is giving back to, again, the veteran community. As you continue down our normal slider from light to dark roasts, and then, of course, you're going to see the apparel and gear, coffee bundles, coffee sampler, and then always the best sellers. So... Just remember, coffee lovers are always going to love coffee things. So keep that in mind for holidays, birthdays, anniversaries, whatever it actually may be. My guest today is my good friend, Casey Hildreth, who I met while he was working for Mike Glover at Fieldcraft Survival, teaching shooting instruction. He is now currently the training director for Cloud Defensive. They make flashlights. They make very powerful flashlights, small ones uh, to the point that I actually carry them in my fanny pack as part of an EDC, even though I don't really like that term, to bigger ones. But here's what I'll tell you about all of their flashlights. It is so much fun to shine them in your friend's eyes and sometimes accidentally in your own because they will blind you. And it's just something that I enjoy doing. I've always liked being like, hey, buddy, what's going on? Shining them right in the eyes. I have no idea what that has to do with – Casey, other than the fact that he works for that organization. And if you want an awesome flashlight, check out Cloud Defensive. Before that, though, he spent a good amount of time in the Army, 19 years, most of that time as a Green Beret. Multiple deployments throughout the world. Got out in 2019 to focus on being a father. He's a father to five amazing children. And he's also a board member for the Resilience Foundation which was founded by his wife, Erica Hildreth. And to date, they have raised $50,000 to support other veteran nonprofit organizations. One of the things I love the most about Casey is that he's totally open and honest and transparent about his own experiences in life, positive and negative, successes and failures. And I just deeply appreciate somebody willing to speak on both the good and the bad, in the sunlight and in the shadows, if you wanted to use that analogy or metaphor. And that's kind of what we did for the next few hours. So hopefully you enjoy the conversation. Episode 317 with Casey Hildreth. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Flashy. <sighs> Flashy, if you will. Decorative. Festive. Those are all words that I think people, when describing me, they would be synonymous. You know? Uh, I would need to look up the word synonymous real fast to make sure I use it properly, but that, that's what I would think. Agree to disagree. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Make sure you're Michael, doesn't Michael where are you at, dude? Where are you at on that <laughs> not, not doing my job yet again. I literally just, after you walked out, I complimented him. I was like, man, you do a fantastic job. He's like, I know he gives you a lot of shit. You know, but he, you do a great job. And he's like, oh, thanks, man. That means a lot to me. I was like, I'd never say that in front of him. Because you Let's know. talk about the job he did today. He came in. All the cameras were on and set up. The lighting was mm-hmm. good to go. The... Recording mixer board was already set. The AC was already off. So what exactly would you say you do here, Bob? <laughs> hmm. I See? keep the show going. <laughs> yeah, he hits record. He keeps it going. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes he forgets. I've, I've never, I've okay, never missed. Some reds, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we forget to shift cameras, you know. What we did last time, we had one camera for five minutes focused on Erica. Yeah. You recall yeah, that? She has some very uh, particular commentary. Comment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did a change agent episode this morning and forgot to hit record on the video. Thank God they have a backup recording for me. Did you zoom it? 
Yes, and they were recording on the back end. It was actually an awesome com- conversation with a cybersecurity expert, a professor in England, uh, just talking about shit. We talked about cybersecurity threats, TikTok, uh, just everything, personal data, privacy, Patriot Act a little bit. It was wild. Yeah. None it's, of that was captured on my end by video. <laughs> I think it was wild. When we watch it again, it'll be wild. Now, that, that, uh, that's a whole other uh, avenue of approach people can be attacked from that not a lot of people really care about. You know what I mean? I think they probably should. But It was last year, since this is on the top of my mind, a $6 trillion mm-hmm. industry. Right. Mostly um, the ransom type stuff. He said that the threats are increasing in numbers exponentially and the complexity of the threats is accelerating and also increasing at a at, at a volume level that is hard to actually calculate yeah. because the technology the technology tools are so advanced but so easy to use that you no longer need to be an expert to do that type of stuff. Right. They're just doing it through bots now and things of that nature. Through bots and just volume. So he said he almost fell for one. He got an email from PayPal and it was talking about his uh, account. Hey, you need to log into your account. Uh, the classic one, I, I honestly think I get a couple of these a day and he described the exact same thing that I do. I go up to the subject line of the email and I click on the email address. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I love it because I'll get them from Bank of America and you click on the email address, and it's like Frank one one seven nine Alpha X Ray forty two at right. you know eatdicks dot com. Yeah, and you're like I'm not going to click on any of the links that are in here. He said it said PayPal, and he almost clicked on the link, and then he took another look at it, and the L in PayPal was a one. Wow, dude. And yeah, this, this is sixty one year old professor, an expert in cybersecurity in the UK. Almost got him. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> even mess with anyone. I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you're, we're flooded with that stuff. Um, one of my older inboxes is flooded with that stuff. I don't even hardly. I just go through and delete everything. Some of them you don't even have to open, though, right? Is that? Oh, uh, I think that's a little bit more complex, and I think that's if you, just targeted. Thing, I think right? if you hit that level, yeah, you are being targeted by a nation state. Fun. Yeah, and he actually talked about that. He said, you know, so the ransomware is a big one. He said that is criminal activity. They okay. want money. He said. So like the link, you know, click on the link. They're trying to get access to your financial information. And before I forget, he said another reason that it stopped him is he uses a different email address for everything financial. He bifurcates the information that comes in and he realized I don't do PayPal with this email address. And that's actually what got him to go back and look at the email address again. Just food for thought out there for people. It's a really good idea. Yeah. He says, so he was saying ransomware, criminal in nature generally. There could be an entity, an organization behind it, but they're looking for money. They're mm-hmm. trying. They're either trying to hold shit hostage, or exploit your financial data. If you're targeted by something like that, and they're only trying to gather data and they're not trying to get anything out of you, the likelihood that it's a state level actor right. is very, very high. Yeah. Which absolutely makes sense because they're just gathering intelligence. Yeah. I, well, I'm not that important. What do we do? Yeah, I don't, no, I don't. Oh, okay. oh, Pegasus. Yeah, this was one. Of, this it was right. uh, developed in Israel, and I think mm-hmm. I had that on one of the things I was going to talk to him about. And I tried to keep the change agent ones to like an hour. We were at like an hour twenty five, and I hadn't even got to it, so we wrapped it up. Yeah, but yeah, the Pegasus. This is one where I think you don't have to interact. But again, I th- I'm pretty sure, and I say this with absolutely no expertise, knowledge, or understanding, <laughs> that you have to be. Uh, it's basically like a nation state right. level thing. I, yeah, I'm com- talking completely out of my scope right now. I'm yeah. actually receiving education on this, but yeah, that stuff's scary, man. Um, well, I figured out a way around it. Just be broke as fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> nice. We want all your money. No problem. Do yeah. you accept cashier's checks for under $5? I don't have the money, so <laughs> uh, joke's on you. I guess. Dude, um, what do you want to talk about, Casey? I don't know. I asked you that yesterday. You're just like, I don't know. We'll just talk. People, um, people think that I have some overarching... Or arching architecture when people sit down. And sometimes I do, and sometimes it's no. better just to sit down and talk. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Um, I don't know. What's what's hot topic right now? What's on Andy's plate? What does Andy want to talk about? You have kids, right? I do. I have all the children. How old are your kids? Okay. Two seven-year-olds, a 12-year-old, 14 and 15. All right. So you're asking me what's on my plate, and I'm glad because at the age of seven, you're not too far from this. Imagine one of your seven-year-olds, but they're like three, and you force-fed them some Indian food, some curry. 
Let's do that. And then you just unfolded that diaper later in the day and put that on your plate. That's kind of what I feel like was on my plate right now. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that crowded, huh? I'm not saying it's crowded. I'm saying it's a <laughs> spicy hot dish <laughs> that is sometimes hard to smell, look at, and handle. Overflowing, huh? Yeah, no, I get it, man. And I don't know if that's the time of the year. Um, I, I, every year I say the same thing. How the fuck did we get to the end of whatever fill-in-the-blank year it is? Right. But, uh, I mean, there's obviously some stuff we can we can talk about uh, openly on the podcast and other stuff. You know, yeah, we're still course. navigating our way through, but it seems like there's a lot right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. How much of that is manufactured by the time of the year? I mean, there's a lot of obligation, a lot of... Yep you know, both financial, emotional and, and family things that we got to take care of well and things start to stack up um, relatively quickly. I don't know. It's a rough time for you. I'm not, I'm not huge on this time of the year, but I will say this. I'm probably in the best place that I've been in a very, very long time at this time of year. So it's been a little easier for me. I, 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 I think, I think the better question is, is how often do people load their plate up willingly or unwillingly or intentionally or unintentionally with that spicy Indian food cuisine, if you know yeah. what I mean. I think the answer is more often than not they do it to themselves. I get the I, – I I won the lottery with my parents. Yeah, yeah. My father's, for anybody who watches or listens to the podcast, clearly out of his mind. I think the last episode we did on Friday, Michael was in here. It was tough to maintain professionalism because of what was coming out of his mouth. Literally referred to his grandson as a gay blade, which I didn't know how to take that. Michael almost fell out of that chair. Well, and I, all I can really say is my mom was kind of the exact opposite and somehow tolerated him for 30 plus years of right. marriage. But they were awesome. So Christmas, yeah, it's interesting. I say that one layer away from my mom and dad. Christmas, I, I always felt great, you know, that time of the year. Right. We, and this actually ties back into the episode I just did with my dad. He, I'll say this because I know he wouldn't have a problem with it. I saw him the next day and he goes, hey, can we redo that podcast? And I said, why? He goes, I didn't realize how much I was hitting that piece of metal on the table. And when you asked me why I was, and I said, it's my father. He goes, I actually have been really struggling with issues with my dad for about 10 days. Wow. And he's open about that type of right, stuff. So of I feel comfortable saying that. So I feel like I won the genetic lottery, but one sliver of the onion away from me, my dad's father, and this ties back into the holidays, because one of the last memories I have of my grandfather is we went to his house, and I was young, so I, I'm, my memory of this, the specific details are a little bit more hazy than kind of like the, some of the visual stuff. My dad already realized he was going to cut himself off from his father right. and what he didn't want to do was abandon his mom so we went up there with the goals of hopefully extracting her from that situation in the end the cops got called so the last holiday memory I have with anything really beyond my biological parents is the red and white flashers bouncing off the right. far wall inside of my grandfather's house that's yeah wild that but yet I still like you know trauma is trauma and everybody deals with it. I don't care who you are. We both know high net worth people. And right. for those out there that think that their life is perfect and they don't have any problems, you are losing the forest for the trees. Money does not solve issues. It solves some issues. It does. Like teeth but, and titties. You know right. what I mean? Like It or, complicates. <laughs> it complicates life though as well. The two T's, know? which is what Michael's looking for in a significant other. It's a different, that's it. That's, that's a, a different nice yeah, smile that's, on the that's, uh, that's the only bar they have to pass. Which one's more important? Mm, titties. Okay, fair enough. So he's an honest man through and through. You can't blame him. Um, that's actually pretty wild. Your your history. We've we've come to find that our our history matches up pretty well, and even in that that realm as well. I think every family, if you go deep enough, and maybe it's generations long before you ever knew of the person. Right. There's crazy in every family. Hundred percent crazy in every family, and there's going to be somebody who. Like you didn't invite Uncle Bob over to the picnic, did you? Right. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. I, I think that so. My father was an amazing human being. My mother as well, still is, and my mom's still here. But from what he came up in, the situation, what he had to model a relationship off of, yep. his, being his parents, he went the exact opposite direction. And my childhood was amazing because of those two people. Um, 
And I learned how to love people from watching those two people, treat yep. people with respect, you know, honor my wife and, and all of those things. That's where I learned that from. But he had to do a complete 180 from what he knew and created a, an amazing life for my brother and I and obviously my mom. So I think that's the choice, right? I mean, it, you it. can either cascade it downhill, which does happen. And I'm sure you and right. I <clears throat> both know people who were treated like shit growing up and and turn hand families and treated other people like shit, or they decide that it's going to stop with them and right. they go the complete opposite route. Right. I don't have any stats on that, but I hope it's definitely greater than 50, 50 that it goes the other direction. Uh, yeah. I, I hope so as well. But you know, the, the people that continue to repeat that process, um, there's a way out of that as well. You know what I mean? Just, it takes an objective look at yourself to change behavior. That's how old were you when you think you were able to start objectively looking at yourself? It hasn't been that long, to be perfectly honest with you. Probably we're talking a couple, couple weeks, or what are we talking about? Uh, you said that not that 36 long. Thirty-six hours ago. <laughs> no, I would say, uh, I would say about four years ago. Man. Yeah, three, four years ago. What was the switch? Um, I wanted to stick around, and I was living a life in a manner that both. You're talking about stick around, like existentially, like you were thinking about checking out. Yeah, I'd gotten to that point. Things had gotten that bad. Um, and I luckily was able to go do a therapeutic uh, retreat, if you will, that essentially saved my life. But the thing that being after the fact, I had the clarity, like all of the noise had quieted down and I, I had a choice. I could continue to live the way that I was living. I, that was completely up to me. And frankly, I did for about, I continued to drink and I was like, well, and one day I was like, why am I still doing this? I was like, I don't have anything to hide from anymore. I don't have anything. Those things aren't bothering me anymore. I don't, I'm not continuously like living out of my, um, the back of my brain anymore. So what am I even doing? You know, um, how did you get to that point? And I don't mean the point where you decided to change. How do you think you navigated your way to that lowest point? Um, I think that I was the condition uh, being PTS. And I, I know there's, this is, there's a thousand people that talk about this, mm -hmm. but the condition being PTS, I had tried everything else. I'd been to, um, inpatient rehab. Um, I'd been to, uh, outpatient rehab. I'd gone to AA, all of the things. Um, yet I continued to self-medicate to, and, and not, I was temporarily dealing with the issues that were actually the root of the problem. And I, through those modalities wasn't able to um, not necessarily relinquish that, you know, get that stuff off of my mind, but through traditional modalities, it just, nothing stuck for me. Rotate that microphone a little bit more towards your mouth. There you go. You love saying that. Get it closer to your mouth. You do it every time. I do it. First off, I need, you have to participate in me saying that because I mean, I guess we could have a conversation like this. It's like, yeah, so, you know, but it's better if you put your face into the microphone. <laughs> you know, I was having an interesting conversation with Sebastian Younger the other day, who I think this, like, that's the coolest aspect of having a podcast is talk, like, this morning, the talk with a cybersecurity expert. Right. That's the coolest shit right. by far, is getting to interact with people. His documentary, Restrepo. If you haven't watched it, turn this fucking episode off right now and just go watch it. Yeah. And it like it's it's awesome. And we were talking about the D mm -hmm. of post traumatic stress. Because I and I'm not my jury's still out on this, but he is changing my mind in the way that I'm thinking about it. I thought that it was like just a straight up a disorder. Mm -hmm. And he said Human beings are evolved to deal with trauma. If not, the first time a exactly. saber-toothed tiger came into a fire and yeah. grabbed somebody out by their feet, the entire human species would have ended. It's the people – he's like about – after about a year, um, and he didn't really necessarily quote any science about that, but even a catastrophic loss of a loved one, child, whatever it is, after about a year, you should be returning to right. – functionality. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say normalcy because I think those type of events change what your normal is. He said the disorder comes in is when you go past that year or you are unable to return to it. So I think right. that there's both. I do believe that post-traumatic stress is a normal thing and, and I'm changing now. Like there is, a, there is a place for the disorder, but what I think is dangerous is applying a blanket term and perspective right. to everybody. Right. And I think that's something that's, that 
the view is kind of the lens is shifted on that. That was a phenomenal episode, by the way. It's probably one of my favorites you've ever done. But uh, yeah, he did. A, he explained it much more eloquently than I did, obviously. But um, yeah, his listen to his kind of journey through that process as well was was eye opening. I, I'm I educated myself like I researched the crap ad nauseum when that after my diagnosis mm-hmm. what was kind of a relief you was, got it post-military like on your way out uh i got it while i was still in okay yeah and you know, started doing the the recovery stuff they were like let's get you all the help we can you know thank goodness um probably helped me stick around to be per- to be frank with you yeah and i'm not saying that from an oh pitiful me standpoint I, i'm just saying it because not to normalize that but if you're feeling that way you have a choice you can go get help or you can continue to live out the way that you are um and you know the end is is coming at some point um but you you don't have to do that man you don't have to do it so how was it manifesting itself for you i had gotten to the point where i just didn't didn't care about anything just flatline essentially yeah um, I refer to it as walking around dead. A lot of there's a lot of different, mm. uh, a lot of different ways to phrase it, but that was probably the best way. Like I was already gone, if you will, um, doing everything I could to to not think about that stuff. You know, avoiding like as, to the point of not going on post just because I was like the smallest things. And I, I hate to use the word trigger, but it's that's accurate, exactly man. it. Yeah. Really is um, to the point of like you know, seeing someone in uniform or, or even listening to the verbiage being used in, in an office or some, you know, it's just like, man, I can't do this anymore. You know, can you point back to any experiences or exposure throughout your career that you think were the most impactful that trended you in that direction? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I can actually pinpoint it. There was, uh, it was in August of two thousand and nine i believe there's a rocket attack on uh, the camp and there were casualties the sirens are still going off afghanistan or iraq this is not iraq we heard people screaming uh from outside the compound like clearly i mean you recognize the sounds um so my buddies uh cory and jeremiah grabbed aid bags and started running towards where we thought the things were coming from Got there, uh, direct impact uh, on a bunker as people were going in. So uh, an eviscerated female soldier and uh, another one that was had the entire back. It was like, I say all that to say these were United States soldiers. Yeah. They were American citizens. The And not to dehumanize the opposition in that conflict, but that stuff never really bothered me. Kids and women a little bit, but yeah. that was the pinpoint. Um, because we worked on, uh, the patient, the female for an hour, we were trying to get her O2 sats high enough to get on the bird. And I was reassuring her continually. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Um, and then come to find out she passed on the way to Baghdad and that sat with me like not then it manifested much later. I was still able to do, you know, be a operator for lack of a better term until about 2016 but i was just continuously getting sicker and sicker um and to the point where like my functionality at work my cognitive abilities and decision making was not where it needed to be to, in the position that i was in so hmm. yeah pretty rough one it's such a complicated it's such a complicated subject um, how many people are on an ODA? About 16? Uh, well, it's supposed to be. It's MTO 12, but normally about – if you got 10, you're doing pretty good. So. Were you a 18 Delta? I was a Charlie. Which but I, I want to say is comms, but that makes too much sense. So that probably was like a word it, that starts with that. Assume. Engineer, yeah. Of course. There you go. What's an 18 X-ray? An X-ray is a – Don't say fucking comm guy because that would piss me not, off. No, it's a guy that <laughs> signs up. It's just like an 11 X-ray. 11 X-ray has a – contract to go to ranger or to rasp now not rip anymore an 18 x-ray is a guy that goes he's got a dedicated contract to go to the yeah. go to selection i'm so. just saying let's keep it easy 18 echo engineer 
18 Charlie. I'm not disagreeing with comms. You. I didn't make the rules. I know. I'm just saying. I have a hard enough time speaking Navy. We start getting into the other branches, and I get. Well, I'm the same way with the Navy. I'm like, what? Are you a rear admiral ensign? At times. Okay. At times. That works. Yeah. No, I, I ask that because in my experience, which is all that I can speak for, mm. I think sometimes the modern media does a really poor job of portraying what it's actually like to be on target. You're right. just like 50 guys in a room and everybody shares the same experience when the reality is you might be lucky to have two other guys in there. Right. You know, but let's say, let's say you, you, you cross the threshold of a courtyard and you're making your way to like a primary entry point and something kicks off the six different experiences and exposures from an outset are relatively the same. Mm but not on the impact that it has on the person. And that's why I asked if you could point to anything. Yeah. It's, uh, and then it, it got me thinking about when they put me through NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence right. in uh, DC, I was talking, I spent a lot of time with psychologists and psychiatrists because that was part of the curriculum. Right. And I, I am kind of fascinated and I would ask them, well, why? You know, why post-traumatic stress with this person, but not this person? Why is this person crippled, this person seems to be a better version of themselves because of their experiences. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them pointed back to the locus of control, meaning... Do tell. So did you expect violence when you would leave a forward staging area and start heading towards an objective? Absolutely. Around every corner, yeah. right? How many times when you were exposed to violence was it on your terms? The vast majority, safe yeah. to say. I would say we had so. the tactical and technological right. advantage. We can see at nighttime, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to breach. We're going to use sensors. We got thermals. We're super good at hide yeah. and seek. And right. by that, I mean we just have tools that let us cheat. Right, right. Which I support at all times. Yeah, absolutely. So when you encounter violence, it's on your call. Right. You're deciding when you are exposed to violence, you're looking for it, you, you're, your sharp teeth are out. The situation what you were describing, you didn't have control. Yeah. So the locus of control has shifted from you or a person like you in that situation to now it is outside of your control. And from my understanding, again, I'm obviously not a psychiatrist or psychologist, that really starts fucking with the geometry between your ears. Yeah. And if you think about it, we were at uh, my last deployment was in 2010 and we were in Afghanistan at a at a I don't even I think it was about halfway up Route 1 from uh, Kandahar to Bagram mm -hmm. and the mine sweeping platoons. And I, I don't know if that's the right term or squad or whatever it may be. Can you imagine sitting in the mm -hmm. back of an RG 33 with a roller up front and, you know, and you just, your job is to go find an IED. You want to talk about scrambled eggs? You yeah. could see it in them getting their gear on. They like, how could you possibly want to do that job? Right. And so that's the locus of control. One, it's just you have absolute control over when you encounter that violence and trauma, and a lot of the time you are imparting it on others. And the other one, you're out of control. And, right. And I don't know. I haven't talked to too many guys who can really pinpoint um, – an exact experience like that, but it's interesting that it falls into where you are reacting to it as opposed to being directly involved with it and having control. Well, so in the, the research that I did and by no stretch of am I like no accreditation as far as a researcher or anything like that. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist or a doctor either, Andy. So I know you're surprised, but nor um, am I for clarity. Hmm. Yes. Um, but they're looking at the onset from six months after the event mm -hmm. And in the DSM-5, out to 20 years for manifestation of symptoms. <laughs> That's a long walk. Exactly. But, I mean, look at that span of time, and you're like, this stuff started manifesting with me later, what I would consider, consider about three to four years after the fact. And I had no idea. Like, I'm like, what? what's happening? I, I was convinced everyone around me was crazy. Yeah. And I was okay. But that absolutely wasn't the case. As a warning sign for people, as a human being, I think that is a place, if you ever think that, that I am the only one that's okay in this situation and everybody else is around you. Tread with caution. Mm. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm sure as fuck not saying you're right. Hmm. 
And how many times have you ever found yourself in that situation where you had the juice and everybody else was totally wrong? The answer for me is zero. Yeah, none. Right. <laughs> so be cautious. I mean, you can use that as a warning sign. That's weird. I feel awesome, but everybody else around me doesn't feel that way. Why could that be? Hmm. Hmm. Well, that now on the backside of that's giving me the the foresight now to start any problem that I run into or anything I'm addressing is take a look at myself first. You know, what have I done to uh, either mitigate or perpetuate this situation? You know, what yeah. I mean? um, but kind of coming back to the the whole part of it, it's like, what are we doing on the backside of this for people? You know, what is each like you were kind of referring to the experience as it pertains to going to the breach, mm -hmm. you know, two or three people you're in contact with. That's three experiences. Well, in those three experiences, there's three algorithms that have been created from day one up until that point. Yeah. So when we're looking at treatment modalities, how do we address that? Like, do we have a kid that was treated like shit? Do we have a kid that came from a healthy home? Do we have a kid that was a rock star in high school? Do we have a kid that got picked on in high school and is there to prove all this? But, you know, what are we what are we working? What's the baseline to work with? And the answer is we don't have one. So what are we doing on the backside? Yeah. You know, and I think how much emphasis how much emphasis or obligation do you think the military has as somebody is exiting? Oh, wow. I really hate that I have to be honest here, but I, very little. I actually I land at the same place, but I, that's not to say that I don't think people need help. I think it's a better role for like an NGO. Right. I think there's a bridge step there. The military is good at taking somebody from any walk of life, shaking them up a little bit, right? Like not breaking Humpty Dumpty's eggshell, but your yolk's a little razzle-dazzled, et cetera. Right. And they break them from the we to the me to a degree. Some mm -hmm. people more than others. You'd wear a uniform and, you know, all of those things. Teaching them how to do their job. I mean, if you just look at, at Navy boot camp, it was eight weeks on the way in, and the TAPS program was, I think, two weeks on paper on the on the way out, and I went to A class in that right. and got it signed off. But I also and I and wait. I, did you shortcut that, Andy? Did you use your position to shortcut that program? Um, let me see. How long have I been out here? I've been out for ten years, which I'm going to hope the statute of limitations <laughs> would end on. I just signed all the signature oh, blocks okay. myself. Okay, let's make it sure. And not as guidance for somebody. But if they wanted to do that, don't use the same pen. Right, right. I used to help teach the tandem course for JSOC, and people would come. There was a basic jump number requirement. Mm -hmm. It's like, hello, good sir. Can I see your logbook? Is there a reason why the last 150 jumps right. all are written with the same pen, the exact same inflection and stroke of this ink? Mm -hmm. You would never be lying to me, right? <laughs> Because you're about to strap yourself to another fucking human being. This is a government document. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pencil whipping that yeah. goes on in that. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. These are questions I ask myself because people ask me these questions. I don't know the answer. I, I just – the military is good at breaking things. They're not good at putting stuff back together. And maybe, maybe that's just the way it should be and then we find the bridge. And right. I think the bridge would be better served through a different organization. I don't think the VA is the answer either, even though I've had I've had some good experiences with the VA, but I've also heard horror stories that would make Correct. you want to go cause substantial personal and infrastructural damage to those said facilities. Right. Um, but there are a lot of organizations out there, um, the Green Bray specific, SEAL specific, Ranger specific. Like they're all out there, and I'm not saying that they're all great, but um, – I think that might be a more effective and efficient way. I, I think it's the only way. And it, it's unfortunately that financial burden is being bore by the private sector for the most part, the organizations that are doing that. And it's like I, Chris Miller talked about this uh, on Sean's show a couple of weeks ago, came out or whatever. Chris, I used, Chris Miller was my battalion commander at one time. Probably one of the most. He was the sec def, correct? He was the sec def as well. Um, probably. His strategic acumen is unmatched. The man is brilliant. He worked uh, at a couple of – no, at one SMU. The also known as a special mission unit. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for the acronym. It's all right. Definitely. You would be shocked at the number of messages I get. What does that mean? <laughs> so um, I do the best I can to unpack it. I appreciate that. We and I'm sure they do too. In, we speak in a different language. That we do. It goes – Leah was the one. She's, I would have an entire conversation. She would say – 
<laughs> Would you mind filling me in on what the fuck you were talking you about? Ta- she doesn't use those words. I'm, I'm filling that in right. creatively. Of course. Um, but at any rate, he, he kind of addressed all that. I believe you wrote a book. I'm looking for it right now. I, I prefer the hard copy, but um, I'm going to give that a listen. But he, I think he talks about a lot of this stuff um, and how we're – uh, the pool is being diluted because there's all these organizations that are out here doing things differently yep. and they have different or over 40,000 service-based organizations right. targeted specifically just towards veterans. And how many of those are actually legitimately <sighs> trying to do things? You Hard know to say. I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, I think you need to vet those organizations. I, I'm not suggesting regulation of those organizations, but if you're getting involved with those, make sure that you're uh, hitching your, hitching yourself to the right wagons, if you will. Um, but that said, I, I don't have the answer either. I think it starts with the individual um, because you can't help somebody that doesn't want help. And that was me for a long time um, because I didn't think I needed it. So you have to take that objective look or be forced. Did in- you really think you didn't need it or you just were unwilling to accept the fact that you did? That's a great question. Um, Most of the time when I am galactically fucking up which I tried to spread out and disperse over the broad span of my life because it really sucks when you repeat like day after day. I'm doing this again. I don't know of a time where at some level I wasn't aware of it. Right. I might have argued with you to your face and said, no. Oh, I didn't know that. In the back of my mind, it's like, God, I kind of knew that. I, you know, if, when I look at my former self, and I'm not even blaming this on I was – I had some narcissistic, narcissistic tendencies um, and some behavioral patterns that were, um, I wouldn't say diagnosable, but I really, like, I can't say that I, I, and I'm ashamed to say this, I'll put that out there, but I'm not really sure that I ever got to a point where it was like, yeah, maybe I do need some help because I was just like, I was just going through life and I was like, well, this sucks, but yeah, you know, I'll just drink it away or I'll just... You know, That's what I'm talking right. about. It's you a good I mean? long-term strategy. Wow, dude. You know, it's this, how, it sounds asinine even saying it, but I truly that, thought that way. Pair that with trying to make your mortgage payment every month in exactly. Vegas, and you have a winning plan for mm-hmm. success. Yeah. It kind of, you know, it's it's called coming up out of the drain. That's that's how you do that. Yeah. So some do it. <laughs> some try to. I don't think we should put that in doctrine. Yeah. No, it's wild, man. I think – what year did you get out? Uh, 2019. Dude, by 2019, even in the mid 2000s, in the aughts, if people will, in the aughts, the special operations community had already been placed onto a pedestal. I don't think it's unfair to say that the vast majority of people, and I'm including myself in this, have a level of ego and narcissism associated with that. Yeah. The stuff that we were able to do is fucking hard, man. Yeah. There are a lot of people who want to do it and will even take the preparatory steps to prepare themselves to do it, and they get there. And they face the crucible, and it smashes them into dust. Right. It's I, I don't ever want to define myself, but what I used to do. But I also, I mean, like there is, you have to take an objective moment, and be like, okay, like what we were able to accomplish is not easy. And I'll use the term average person. I don't even know what the fuck that means, but I'll just right. use a commonly accepted term. There is a level of narcissism that is associated with that. I mean, you know why seals prefer the Silver Ranger compass, right? Oh God. No, I don't, Andy. Do tell, please. It's got the biggest mirror that you can flip open and check your hair. <laughs> that's, <sweet. laughs> that's nice. Where do you think I was going with that? I, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, you're, you're very. You guys use lensatic shit. It's like I don't know how to do that stuff. You guys are talking about mills and all sorts of shit, bro. What is a knot? A knot? One point one mile per hour. Oh, really? Yeah. There you go. You're welcome. You'll never use that information again unless you're a pilot. What or is what's a nautical mile? It's not 1.1. Is it really? I didn't think it was associative. Fuck. Michael? <laughs> yeah. I, I might be I'm pretty sure it's 1.1. Okay. A nautical mile, I pre, I'm pretty sure, is 1.1 statuette miles. A knot of speed is 1.1 miles per hour. Okay. So if you're doing like 60 knots, you're doing 66 miles per hour. Why do you guys do that? First off, For when boats? you say you guys, I was in the Navy, but I don't know shit about the Navy. All it's right? because of boats. Yeah. 1.15. Okay. Hold on, click on, uh, yeah, okay, one nautical mile, good, and then why are knots used instead of miles per hour? I think that's just for aviation and uh, air stuff. They're easier to navigate with, obviously. Hmm. Why would it be easier Because we navigate? change everything. I don't know. It's very strange. Yeah, we use that, so it's funny, right? We use that for, uh, 
you know, jump stuff. Wind, yeah, yeah, five right. gusting to seven right. knots. But we'll measure all of our walking distance in kilometers. Right. Right. <laughs> ranges vehicles, and meters. Ranges yeah. and meters or yards, depending right, on where right. you're at. Speed in vehicles, miles per hour. Right. God, I wonder if a just this group of geniuses it created the US military and they're like, okay, here we go. How many branches? Good. Forever for however many branches there are, you have to have your own individual way to describe units of measure. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that? We use way? ranger beads in seals. Like the beads that keep track of your pace count? Yeah, I'm familiar. Oh, I, oh, I bet you are. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, do you remember your pace count? Not off the top of my head. Because we had our kick count, too, for our 100 yards oh, underwater, okay. or 100 meters underwater. Because, of course, diving is in meters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> fucking no. That's wild, man. Yeah, I used to know my pace count on flat terrain, on even terrain, mm-hmm. uphill, downhill, through foliage, snow, like right. the whole nine yeah. yards. Well, you had to. And I am so happy that I can't remember that anymore because that would be absolutely wasted. I'd be, I'd be throwing a guess. I'd be throwing a guess at it if yeah. I tried it. I can't remember calling mine either. I feel like if there was a true study done on the efficiency of the military, they would classify the results at a level that is well beyond any clearance you and I have ever heard of because of the impact of the insanity of the it, you know, and it almost became like the further up the chain I went. It's like it, it's it was normalized. You're like, yeah. no, you can't do this, and and here's why. You're like, oh, well, that makes absolutely no sense, Roger. Yeah. yeah. And he pushed back. He's like, what are you what are you even doing? Yeah. I don't know. Sheer bananery. Yeah, the Silver Ranger. It's good for navigation and taking a look at yourself. You know what I'm saying? Checking well, that hair. I am going north. <laughs> Oh, Oh, come on. What good times. It's like tossing me softballs, man. I can make fun of the SEAL community all day long. I don't know. I I, I love I love you guys. Like for the here's my thing with my friends that I have a a lot of friends from the NSW community now. Yeah. And individually these people are remarkable human beings. Yourself excluded, obviously. Of course. Um present company. (laughs) <laughs> but, um, like when I worked with them, like on a military, on an operation, it was just so different from the way that we would address problem sets and, yeah. you know, um, just to like basic maneuvering and whatnot. It was planning is a big difference. It's huge. difference as well. The single so. worst military experience I ever had was with a Green Beret captain. I oh, wow. leave it as broad as that. And it's funny because people think that, and I think pre 9 11, we did internally fight a lot more. Mm hmm. Because we were fighting for budget. And of relevance. course. We always would get the job done post 9-11, but there are cultural differences for yeah. sure. But there also are different – the communities are – You know, if you look at rangers, I mean, if you look at the actual medals, the mission essential task list for rangers, it's to jump into and seize airfields. Right. Which I hope that they don't have to do that a lot because that sucks. Yeah. The SEAL community, literally, if you draw it back to its origin, it's to do depth soundings before amphibious invasions. Yeah. And no, maybe go you. into the hinterland, you know, and it wasn't until Vietnam that they actually really developed the, you know, the amphibious nature of it. But, you know, Green Berets, it was, uh, it's, the medals are around FID, right? right. Foreign Internal Defense. Correct. The by, with, and through training a partner force, yeah. um, you know, force multiplying and all that stuff. Who else do we have? Air Force Special Operations? What do they do? They tell us about the weather. <sighs> and they wow. talk to airplanes too. That's good. The PJs and CCTs are awesome. Yeah. I just don't know enough about their medals to answer that yeah. marines not i'm not touching that with a stick i don't know anything i've ne- i never had the opportunity to work it's the guys like on the back side that i know from that community are again great yeah. guys you know all I you have never... to know about the marines is technically they're part of the department of the navy okay so was it's that true. a dig or is that no it's true i mean they're the men's thing. department don't get me wrong okay yeah got you I mean, the Navy is more along the Ascot side. These guys are more along the ass less chap side, but both still powerful in Understood. their own way. Yeah, yeah. I, that's doctrine, correct? Is that doctrine? I have correct? never seen it in doctrine, but it was described to me and beaten into me physically and metaphorically by my peers that that is, in fact, the way yeah. that gravity works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Marie. I, I actually had fantastic experiences with every one of the branches. It was so uncommon yeah. that I would have a bad experience. And there are, there's a lot of people out there who really talk shit about the SEAL community. 
And I laugh because, like, imagine how much more shit you would talk if you actually knew the truth. Right, right. It's like if you want to sit down and talk, like, come come get me. I'll help you out with that. Right. But it's also wild to see people have one bad experience and they shit can the entire community. Yeah, yeah. Like the ODA captain. Not a fan. Some of my closest friends mm-hmm. are ex-Green Berets. Right. I don't give a fuck. You don't judge the community by the actions of a single individual. It's like, come on. Let's be adults. Yeah. Yeah, now no, that's uh... – a lot of people do that, unfortunately. I, I don't work with uh, some Marine Scout snipers down at they T1G. Just, they just shut that course down. I cannot believe that. What, what do you think the justification for that was? No idea. Like, just from a heritage standpoint, like yeah. the hog's tooth, all that stuff. But what, yeah. even from a capability standpoint? I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe, but I, well, I mean, let's look at it from, I, I can't even make sense of it from a warfare standpoint because we're Making looking it? at near peer threats now um from a technological and a you know from all standpoints if you will like why would we remove that capability from i don't know i don't either i don't know it's soft overall i mean i, I just feel like that they're i'm so glad i'm out now yeah just from the the horror stories that i hear and so recently when I did mean, it change? But but that's the thing. You're like, well, that's I, what I was going to talk to you. I mean, uh, recently I did that video where I was – there's that stupid TikTok video that like, who's more toxic, army or mm. prison? Mm-hmm. And I dug into the recruiting stuff. So this year, Space Force and the Marine Corps hit their numbers. The Army's missed it for a decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 25% this year. All the other branches have fallen short more often than not over the past decade. I'm sure there's a variety of reasons, but that's that's troubling. And then you reduce capability. I mean, is that an issue that they don't have enough people to – like there's no longer enough people to want to go into those billets? They can't support those billets from a logistical perspective? Like, it's a problem. I don't think the world's getting any safer. I think the problems are getting more complex and maybe that lining up tanks against – you know, or aircraft carriers or aircraft, maybe that threat is dissipating a little bit. I'm not smart enough to say that that is the case. I'm right. saying maybe that is the case. But missing recruiting numbers, reducing capability, I'm not an artist, but I don't think that's painting a very good picture. All right. Um, I can't make sense of it. Oh, you were you were around when after when the global war on terrorism began, correct? correct. You were already in. I joined in right? 96. I was in. I had been in for like six months, right? And the culture that I came into and as lower enlisted at that point was, I mean, we were relatively violent individuals and had that mindset it was like towers fell we were actually off that day we had done i think we had done a 30 mile a day i was at ranger regiment at the time and so we were off within two hours the parking lots were full oh for sure like everybody had come in we were on rf1 ranger ready force one so we were part of the package um so everybody was there it's like when when are we going you know about six months later <laughs> my my former squad leader were like when's the because we're all in the back we're yeah. chomping at the bit and he's like i've been waiting for this for six fucking years you guys just calm down you know what i mean he said it much more violent than that and we yeah. did we did some physical activity after the fact but that culture was already established when that happened we were prepared you know we were prepared to go and yeah. those those things were in place like I, I don't understand where we are now you know what i mean i don't understand like as a military, how are you maintaining readiness and pushing down, like pushing all this hogwash? Like Maybe you're not making it the priority. Maybe you're not. That's scary. It is scary, and I think because the military only gets pressed on in limited circumstances, or maybe from a kinetic perspective, smaller communities get pressed on more often than conventional ones, depending on the theater. Maybe you can justify it somehow, but in the long run, I don't see how it's a good strategy. Nor do I. I mean, you're, you're essentially, you know, you're exposing vulnerability, even, yeah. even from a mindset standpoint. It's like, why would you? Why would you do that? So, if you joined pre nine eleven, what what uh, drew you towards military service? Uh, well, I I tried to sign up when I was seventeen. Um, my parents wouldn't sign off on me going early because I had a scholarship, um, and I would have been. Well, my mom graduated from college, and my dad hadn't, and he really was pushing that as you could. It took me about a year to figure out. Well, I generally already knew that I wasn't really into the books that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, the book learning wasn't for me. What sport uh, was your scholarship from? 
Oh, it wasn't from a sport. It was academic. I scored. I find well. that hard to believe. How, why? You know, I'm just going to let that <laughs> because I know sit you. out there. Because I know you. If you were smart enough to get an academic scholarship, you're smart enough to figure that joke out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> No, um, he's like because I know you. That's why. No, uh, no, I just scored well on a on a test, and they gave me a yeah. scholarship. So uh, I never had that experience. Well, I, I, that's surprising to me. I think I had a one point eight. Solid. The bar to graduate high school is low. I somehow tripped about six yards in front of it and crawled just slightly under. <laughs> that blows my mind. Was I it, almost that? didn't graduate, so I had already enlisted in the Navy through the delayed entry okay, program. Gotcha. And it's, I f- don't remember the number of credits you have to have in high school. I was an elective short. <laughs> and this is like two months before graduation. Mm-hmm. I went and found a photography teacher that made a deal with me. And I don't remember the exact number of pictures that I needed to produce. And I mean like go through the, yeah. the regular film, the chemical process. Right, right, right. But I did it in about a week. And he signed off on my credit for that elective. Otherwise, I actually don't know what would have happened. How, I, that, that's so crazy to me. I don't see how, because I, I think that, I feel like that you're probably one of the more intelligent friends of mine. And you the need fact that, you need a larger friend circle. Well, I, I've got to take a look at myself. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I mean? absolutely would. That's what I'm going to do first. Yeah. Like, am I really? That's my- what I can say is, high school had I had no interest in high school. I knew what I wanted to do since I was very young, and I'm not recommending this as a strategy for anybody. But I watched my friends arduously study for like the SATs mm. um, and of God college admiss- admission tests and I forget what they call but essentially writing your resume that you a, a right, college right, application right, right. I didn't do any of that I actually don't know what I mean I know if I had not made it through buds I would have gone into the fleet navy I don't know what that would have ended up looking like I, I feel like I would have gone back and tried again whatever it may be but I had all of my chips like pushed in yeah and I just didn't care. I right. it 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 didn't interest me. Um, and it's not a strategy that I recommend for people. I got very lucky that I well, I didn't even realize the injury rate in buds. I I got lucky. Right, right. Well, let me ask you this: Was buds? And I, I'm I'm asking you this from like from your former self. Was yeah. buds was buds hard for you? Yes, but it's designed to be hard for everybody. Right, and it's actually designed. Not all of Buds is hard. Right. I grew up on the beaches in Santa Cruz, and I did junior lifeguards, mm-hmm. and I played water polo. A lot of people freak out about the drown proofing test, which I'm not. I don't know if you guys do that in any of your pipelines, but it's you know, and of course, what they show in documentaries, or if they want to freak people out, all they do is they show people who are being resuscitated, or no, running. or like hands tied behind right, their right. back, feet tied together, which you you do, but the very first time you do it, it's like there's no restraints. Right. Right. Then it's like a Velcro piece of rope mm-hmm. around your ankles. Right. Then it's a Velcro. It, you know, I mean, it's right. not. It. <laughs> there's ways to portray things. Of course. Make, so they show the ten year overnight success. And it's like this is what it is. Right. So for me, the water stuff, that particular evolution, I loved it because I could only hear the instructors yelling at me when I came up and was, <gasps> and then right back down. I'm like, I don't right. fucking know yeah. what you're saying, and right. I don't care. I right. hope this evolution goes on all day because <laughs> it's not hard. You relax. You exhale and go down, right. and then you bounce up. Take a big breath, and then they throw a mask in eventually, and you grab it with your teeth. You bob a few times. You do a front. It, it's not right. hard. But running on the beach in, you know, jump, well, they were Bates lights at the time, but like a jungle boot or a Bates light or running with a telephone. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's something in that course for everybody. So the whole thing is not hard. Right. But you will find the thing that you suck at and that is going to eat your lunch. Well, that yeah, that's what I was like. The whole thing was not hard. Yeah. That's the thing. Like none of the things like the Ranger indoctrination program that at the point at that point in my life was probably the, obviously the most physically demanding thing I'd ever done. As was Buds for me. But it wasn't hard. Like I, I enjoyed it because I knew at the end of it, I was like I was going to be with the best yep. that the army had to offer. Um, and the same thing for you know, selection in the Q course. I mean, there were hard portions in there. There were, but it, it wasn't hard per se. You know what yeah. I mean? I didn't have to like, I never really redlined. And if I did, it was like, okay, this is the point that I'm supposed to be at. And yeah. So 
when you say you knew what you wanted, to, that's kind of where I came from. It's like walking around in the woods my entire life, my childhood. I grew up in, the, you know, so yeah. it was it was familiar territory for me. So it wasn't hard. I knew what I wanted to do as well. But like I said, my father wanted me to go try that out, and then I bounced around a little bit, um, doing framing and stuff like that. And finally, I was just like, right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do what I feel like I'm supposed to do. So. So straight into the army, and then what? Where'd your progression? How's it goes? Army boot camp. Then you guys have what? AIT. So I went in on eleven X-ray contracts. So I went special forces contract. No, Ranger regiment. But you said contract. eleven X-ray. Yeah, I thought eighteen is, X-ray. Okay. Yeah. Um, at that time, you there were no eighteen X-ray. You couldn't go straight to the course. So, um, basic AIT or OSIT is one station training order. Um, then you go to airborne school, and then they come down from regimental headquarters with a couple of trucks you're standing over your bags and they're like who's get all the rangers over here that are going to the ranger indoctrination program and they say pick your stuff up and follow these trucks so everything you've been issued and you're running down this it's a uh, how inconvenient it's almost like your stuff would fit better in the truck it was so awesome i, I look <laughs> at that moment i swear to god i specific, specifically remember that moment i just i had the biggest smile on my face i was like okay fuckers you know what I mean? Well, especially if you, I remember the phase one, day one of Buds. It has like this aura about it. Oh, of course. Because I've been thinking about this shit since I was 11. Right. And there's so many, th God, there's so many ways you can fuck it up along the way. You know, you can <laughs> get in trouble as a younger kid and do something that, egregious enough that it hits your record and you're disqualified. Right. You can join the military and it's your first time on your own and. You do something stupid on Liberty, orders are changed, you know, your right. job is to chip paint on an aircraft carrier. Start at the bow, when you get to the tail, just keep on going, buddy. <laughs> Somebody's horrific. job is probably that. I'm, I'm making that up. But by the time you get there on day one, I remember that too. Like the instructors come out and they're <sighs> theatrical. It's, it's fabulous. Theater. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the inner thespian of the instructors <laughs> is coming out. Right. And then, you know, they're wearing shirts that are probably a size too small. I feel like they were in the gym sculpting their guns before they came out. Just, it's it's just like everything you've ever wanted to be in your life. And these guys had perfect hair, too, I would imagine. We're talking about the SEAL community. Exactly. It's a oh. requirement. Okay. <laughs> Unless it's not looking good, then you have to shave your head bald. Of course. Because, you know, we can't, you don't want to discriminate just because of that. You could be right. a good operator, but it's, you're either going to have fantastic Fabio hair. Or, or it's you're polished. Gonna be, polished yeah to a spit shine like mm -hmm. jungle boot and spit shine <laughs> but i remember too like i mean on the first day good luck trying to find something that is the correct answer the correct response yeah. you're getting the shit kicked out of you right and i loved it i I'm did like, too fuck man. yeah here we go day one. i didn't like it as much the second day i'm like this is old i'm a little sore <laughs> what's i don't know what's happening to my body yeah like huh, how, many, how many days are left of this shit oh this is gonna suck yeah but yeah there was that sense of anticipation I, I was glad Obviously, the outcome was unknown, but I was so happy to be started. Right, and do you like you remember the group of guys that you were? I mean, I remember I vaguely. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's the same thing. But it's just the the, the mentality is like you're there with those guys, and you're like, bro, we're we're here and we're doing this. You yeah, know but what I mean? the problem is with buds. You say that in the morning, and by the time lunch comes around, a right. lot of those people aren't there. Yeah. So it's not until the later phases of training that you become better right. friends. You literally because you had to run to all your meals. Right. And it was a mile and a half each way when I was there. So you'd run to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It would not be uncommon to have a conversation with somebody on the way to lunch and have to find somebody new to talk to on the way back. Oh, I'm sure. That's <laughs> wild, man. I didn't realize that was a thing. Yeah. Oh, That's you can eject at any time. Just really? raise your hand. Just I do go work. ring the bell. The bell is the ceremonial end? unless you're in Hell Week. Of course, they attach it to the back of a truck, so it's with you at all times. Oh, wow. Otherwise, it lives on the first phase grinder. That's that's cool. Yeah. Ours is the fire at Cold Range for Ranger Indoctrination Program. They have a fire, this giant fire. Yeah. Um, and Cold Range is just like historically, it's just shitty weather, and it's a torture. It's there. I would call it the Hell Week, not to offend anyone from yeah. there, but it's the Hell Week in Rasper or, or Rip when I went through, and it's uh, probably two to three hours top to sleep a night. You're doing land nav, and in between, when you're not doing land nav, if you're being physically tested yeah um so yeah that that was the thing he's like guys everybody just stand here and close your eyes for a second you literally have people falling over going to oh sleep yeah standing. i love it i have yeah personally watched as an instructor people standing up and have done it myself <laughs> wow but there's like hey just all you have to do is go stand by the fire and that when they tell you to open your eyes or they give you front yeah. rest or whatever there's half the people are gone you know it's like 
hypothetically and allegedly, you know, we have these uh, IBS inflatable this boats. This means this is true. This is a true story. No, it's hypothetical. Oh, okay. Because statute of limitations? Unknown uh. at this time as to what the statute of limitations <laughs> hypothetically would be. Right, right. But if you take two students and you take the wooden oars that they have and you make them stand there near something warm, but they have to hold it over their head so it's like a cross swords, mm -hmm. it could or could not be funny depending on whether or not this happens when they start smacking each other in the face as they fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sadistic bastard, dude. Oh, I didn't say I did this. I didn't. I did, Let's I wasn't, not fill in the negative space like that and assume that this is something that I would do. I, I've said that for my. That was that was personal. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I'm a sadistic for laughing at something yeah. that that. No, you can so hundred percent be out on your feet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Been there. What's amazing is your body has that natural reflex, like that startle it reflex. You. Unless you get tired enough, and then what catches you is your it's, nose. It's the ground. <laughs> yeah. I did that one time. One time. Sand softens the blow a little bit. Yeah. This was on linoleum. Ooh. Yeah. Not fun. So was Ranger the desired end state when you got in and then you found out about the Green Beret program? Or was it that kind of the end I wanted state? To, I wanted to be a Green Beret uh, from the beginning, but I would never have voiced that at Ranger Regiment because it's okay. kind of frowned upon, if you will. So um, it was kind of a mandatory milestone along the way? It's the best place to grow up in the Army, I feel like. Um, I didn't – I just wanted to be – with the best unit that I could be with going into. No, I get that. Um, so I went that route because I couldn't go to uh, special forces out of the, out of the gate. Um, it was a plan. Um, but once I did get to get to selection, it's like, and if you go from regiment, they're like, it be it go to SMU selection or you go to, uh, go to be, go to SFAS, you mm -hmm. better make it. You know what I mean? SFAS is the official name of the Q course, right? That is Special Forces Assessment and Selection. Is that pre the Q course? Yes, that's where is. they decide that's who's going to start yeah, that's the, Q the course. That's the screening okay. process, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. I, I, I wanted to do that ultimately. Ultimately, I wanted to go to SMU, but the family things didn't work out. I, yeah. you know, I'm thankful that I didn't at this point because I'm glad where I am in my life right now, and I don't think that I would have been there. Um had I done that, but, yeah. um, how was your first deployment? I'm assuming it was with the Ranger regiment. It was, how was it? It was boring. It was absolutely boring. We did <laughs> more of a common tell than people would actually believe. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was like, it was kind of feeling things out. You know what I mean? It's like, what can, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. And this is granted, this is coming from a, a private at Ranger regiment. I wasn't privy to a whole lot of information. Yeah. But what was the total amount of combat experience in that element? Zero <sighs> minutes. You know, yeah. like it was the second deployment. There were guys actually that came back in from Beco from 1993. So we had a couple of no shit. Yeah, bro. We had some old scrolls rocking around. That's dated whatnot. knowledge, though, man. Yeah, yeah. Dated knowledge. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was zero. They jumped on Rhino on October 19th. We so towers fell September 11th. We left October 11th, and then they jumped on Rhino. I didn't jump on Rhino. Um, I, cause I was a new guy. Probably for the center. So, well, there's the thing, <laughs> a major bell from headquarters took my slot on the bird, um, to which I verbally protested and I didn't have the stature to protest at that time. So I paid physically for that as well. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I mean, I was 22 years old at the time, 23 years old at the time. I'm like, are you fucking serious right now? You know, because that's, I trained to that point. I was proficient at my job i was good at my job and i was like and you just hadn't heard of the game it's called rock paper rank right 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 yeah it didn't yeah rank trumps both rock and paper yeah absolutely <laughs> i learned it i learned that lesson oh today. man i've learned yeah. that one i was on jocko's podcast years ago and he asked me what rank i got in the most trouble and i just started laughing i was like an equal amount at all all of them. yeah <laughs> yeah but that's the thing you can you can argue sensibly i was reacting emotionally. I can point. argue sensibly at the age of 46. Let me just tell you my capacity to act like a fucking child in my 20s and 30s. Well, I've seen you do it at 46 as well. So. I'm not saying it's stopped. I'm saying maybe <laughs> I have a little bit more of a, right. it's like hot water, cold water, and I can do a little bit of a better job of modulating right. what's coming out. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, relatively uneventful for me we did another we did one more mission we went up to pakistan to secure an airfield for the guys 
for the other shmoo mm-hmm. looking for. Was it UBL, OBL? Whatever. You can just say it. Osamas. You can just say Delta. What's the Delta boys? Well, I mean, it's obviously an airline. And M- for those being, if they choose to get offended, we're talking about the airline. MFDF. MFDF. I don't know if I've heard that one. You haven't? No. Motherfucking Delta Force. Oh, I like that a lot. I do too. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I, again, another group of people I had great experience with. Yeah. Oh, They're dude. fucking awesome. Consummate professionals. Robots. Yeah. They're robots. They're robots with more emotions than robots could ever have. Yeah. Yeah. I found it even at the highest level, and this is another one that I don't I don't know if I do a good job of explaining this. People ask me all the time, what's the difference between a conventional SEAL team and a JSOC element? And it starts with they're the same pool of people. Mm-hmm. And what you're really doing is that a JSOC element, it's like we'll take 85 to 90% of your job responsibilities and we're going to take those away from you. Mm-hmm. But you need to be tits at these three things. Right. Not that there's actually three things, but just to throw a number out there that's lower. I mean, how many things, I don't know about you guys it, uh, at Ranger Regiment or at ODA is like, we were constantly chasing currency. Oh my Jesus, God. Dude. Like, how do you use this radio again? Shit. How yeah. do you put that Drager together right. again? What was my pace count? Which end of this law rocket goes boom? Like, yeah. you know, can I shoot this AT4 indoors? No. Okay, right. I can't. Can I one time? I just want to, you know. <laughs> just, just this once. Yeah. But currency, unbelievable. Yeah. But chasing those things. And then it's, hey, your job that we want you to be good at is crossing the threshold of the door and making life and death decisions like that. Mm-hmm. Roger that. And yeah. the support ratio goes to like 15 to 1. Right, right. It's the same people, different job, very, in comparison, narrow mission focus, which allows you. It's like if you had to have brain surgery, I wouldn't want to go to a a general practitioner, I'm going to go to the specialist. Yeah. They, they both go to medical school. One right. guy just is like, I don't do feet shit. I right. do only between the ears. Right, right. But they, I mean, they were some of the smartest people I've ever been around. And they were, I think the more emotionally intelligent that they could be, the better they could make tactical decisions. I have no data to support that. Right. But if I think of the best tacticians that I was ever around, don't get me wrong, there were some autonomous robots but there was also some sociopaths and some psychopaths too. There were people there for the wrong reason. Absolutely. But if I think of the people that I have the most respect for from a tactical perspective, and then I start arraying that against their IQ and EQ, they were very high at both. All right. Well, I think that the in those commands or under that umbrella, you can they have more liberty to address problem sets, be it tactical, tactical or material solutions, they have the liberty and the support to seek out those solutions. And then once presented to up the chain, they're like, yeah, we, we trust you guys to this level, you know yeah. what I mean? And it's inherent with units, tier two, tier three units, you have, there has to be more management. And that didn't really start happening until about 2007, I would say, is I feel like when the command shift started getting into the team rooms a little more. Yeah. Um, but, up until that point it was and that was that was some high intensity stuff back then you know what i mean which kind of comes full circle to things starting to manifest for guys and gals around that 2015 16 time frame i mean you were dealing with a behavioral health pandemic inside of the department of defense due to the op tempo of the conflict from back then you know what i mean yeah um while when did you switch from ranger and start going down the uh green brave 2004 i went to selection i finished the course in 2000 correction i went to selection 2003 began the course 2004 graduated 2005 september signed in and then went to iraq so and then was it kind of just a ping pong back and forth between iraq and afghanistan no i i did two trips to afghanistan with regiment and i never went back really i was iraq the entire time yeah interesting yeah there were still – no, of course there were ODAs in Afghanistan. I was telling you that that experience with that ODA captain was in 2010. So they were obviously – Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just weren't at a command that was – Right. We, we were uh, – no, we, I, st- I was in Baghdad for the majority of it, man. I knew that place front, back, and yeah. center. It was, uh, it was almost like – it was like my second – my summer home, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And you were married during that time period? I was, yeah. How'd that work out for you? Um <laughs> – it, well, <laughs> you seen my new wife? No, um, it was 
it was difficult. I was, you know, obviously my job was my priority at yeah. that point. I, I would tell you otherwise in the time, but I mean, job was a priority and, you know, everything else became second because of, you know, the mental state that I was in. And, and frankly, it's hard to switch from like, Hey, I'm a lethal mechanism at one point and come home and, and do that. Some people can do it. I don't, that, that wasn't me. Yeah. I couldn't do it. Um, I was stuck there, if you will. I was talking with Tom. Well, I, it was the first time I met Tom Spooner. We were at a sniper competition. No, we were at a three-gun competition, and Tom had videos up on his computer, you know, south side of the airfield in Baghdad, um, just, you know, just like team room stuff. And uh, I was, was standing behind him. I was like, gosh, I was like, I miss it, you know. And he closed the computer. He's like, you and I need to talk. I didn't know him from Adam, really, you know, and he started explaining some things to me and it, you know, it, it coming, if you ever speak to the man, you know, it's when he talks, you, you listen yeah, because, you know, he, he listens more than he talks for a reason. But, uh, that was my first exposure to, he's like, Hey, you need to look out for these things. You know what I mean? I, I want to say it was 2011, 2012. Um, and I heeded his advice, but I was like, yeah, I probably should start looking out for that. And Listening to what people are saying and hearing what they have to say are two different things. Yeah, and that's exactly the case with that. Um, but in re- like when things started manifesting and whatnot, I was talking to him quite a bit. I was like, I don't understand this. Like, what am I? And he helped me the best he could. But I was, yeah. I wasn't. I would say I wanted help, but I wasn't in. I didn't have the the capacity to receive the help, if that makes sense to you. It does. You know what I mean? I don't know. How long were you married for, first time? 13 years. You have kids from that relationship, right? Three beautiful children. How is your relationship with your ex-wife? Uh, I would say not uh, ideal. The communication is... Are you saying, like, currently or from that? In general. And I get... Uh, if I'm following my train of thought where I was going with it, I wonder, I was going to ask you if you've ever sat down and talked with her about the person that you feel like you were versus the person you feel like you are now. No, I have not. And I'm not advocating that because I don't want to, and I don't want to, Eric is fantastic. She's awesome. I would never advocate something that would try to be antagonistic in that. Right. But you share kids, which means you're going to share a portion of your life for the rest of your life. Right. And it's a, quite frankly, it's a, it's a selfish question because I don't have the answer to how it's going to go with my ex-wife right. either. And right. it's it's not good. It's something honestly that I would like to do, but she doesn't she doesn't know me now. Do you know do you understand? Yeah, I do. I know exactly what you're saying actually. Yeah. Um she she has a preconceived ideal of who I am from my former self, if you will. And I, I not to refer to it as my former it's all part of me, don't get me wrong. But those behaviors, those, that general view on life no longer exists with me. Thank God. You have know. you forgiven her? Yeah, I had to. I can't. Do you think she's forgiven you? I don't know. I don't know. All I, I really wish her nothing but the best and happiness, obviously, you know, because I mean, she's the mother of my children. That said, I can't do that for her. You know yeah. what I mean? I wish I could, but, um, I don't know. I want I want a healthy environment for our children, and all that they have up to this point is that that relationship that they saw. So, when the decision was made, it was one of my children asked me, "Why is mommy so mean to you?" And at that point, I stopped what we were doing, and I walked in and I was like, "Can't do this. I'm not going to allow my children to think that this is normal." You know what I mean? Because I had been given the gift from my mother and father yeah. that showed me how to treat and respect and love people. And I was like, this is not okay for them. I, I, I was about to say I hate it, and, and that's too, uh, too strong of a term. It breaks my heart when I hear people say, we're going to stay together for the kids. No. Because I so, I so deeply disagree with that. And, I, and I, people, you know, on Fridays, most of the time I'll answer questions or – Mike and I are kick dumb ideas back and forth, but I can give people my opinions. I try not to tell people how to live their life. Right, right. And it's like you can describe it however you want to, but I 
can't think of something worse for your kids than staying in an unhealthy relationship right. under the guise of it's for my kids. Right. Well, in, in all fairness, and let me take some ownership in this uh, because I feel it's the right thing to do. I made mistakes. I was, uh, I, you know, been unfaithful and all those things. And we had decided to try and salvage yeah. the, what remained. But I think that the hurt was too deep. The, the trust was broken and that was being projected both ways. Um, and then, you know, that was like, that was the normal. Why is, why are you guys so mean to you? It's like, no, I can't do that. That's not fair to them. So how is their relationship with their mom now? It's good. good. She, she has, she's a great mother. I mean, there's no question that whatsoever. I, I think that, um, you know, see, there was a time when she was concerned because of the way that I had, you know, what she saw and the path I was going. She was concerned to, you know, for the kids to be around me and whatnot. That's no longer the case, which is good. Um, but like I said, she doesn't know who I am anymore. She yeah. hasn't seen, you know. Yeah, uh, I think sometimes that's the way it goes. Did she ever remarry? Uh, no, I not yet. I don't know. I just, my only thing is, is. As long as whomever that is is suitable for my children. That's Understands what. that at any given moment you can fucking snatch their soul right out of their throat. <laughs> You're gone. <laughs> that's it. And it's not personal. It's not personal. It's that's oh, just. Oh, it's fucking personal. Well, that's the thing. Well, it is. Yeah. God, it scares me at times. What well, does? The, the level of just sheer. I don't even know what it is. It's just like. I know what you're saying. We. And I don't know how this is going to be received by people, and I, I quite frankly don't care. We sit at a coffee shop today, you know, down the street, a business project of Denver and I's, which I'm super proud of, and have a cup of coffee. And I will talk with anybody who comes through the door about right. anything. Mm -hmm. And the level of violence that I am willing to go to for what I believe in and the people that I care for would likely get me locked up for the rest of my life if they could read my inner monologue and thoughts at times. Of course. <laughs> I, I had a uh, I had a conversation about this with a good friend of mine uh, probably three, four weeks ago. Uh, David Acosta, we were, we were discussing violence and when to use it. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to venture into that space any longer because if I find myself at that point, it is you know, to defend myself or my family and already know the outcome at that point. Yeah. So I, I don't really venture into that anymore. I try and stay, it's, I'm not avoiding it, but I'm containing it. It's control of that measure. You know I what I mean? I just think people would, and most people don't walk around their daily life, nor would I advocate that they do like, Oh, I wonder if this guy is comfortable with violence and this one. And right, right. how about this? We just don't know who we're sharing the earth with. So, Maybe give people the benefit of the doubt because there are people out there whose favorite hobby is chopping down fucking family trees. Right, right. And you probably don't want to piss in their Cheerios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> these are the facts. But nobody wants to talk about that. You know what I mean? Why? I, I don't know. It's strange. Like, I to love me. violence. I know you do. You don't know that. I just told you. So I guess now you do because I told you, but it's not something you inherently knew. Even though you got an academic scholarship. Do you need an ascot, Michael? Do we have an ascot or like a... Hey, Michael, let me tell you something. Like around a, real quick, yeah. cap? Here's my Andy policy. When, he's, <laughs> when he starts doing this, it's I have a choice to interact with uh -huh. the statements that yeah, he's making. Uh -huh. And I would, I would encourage you to start practicing that as well. It helps me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Make, just give it a shot. Just if you don't interact, go with it. I'll fire you. <laughs> <laughs> you will. You will play with me, and I'll be immediately hired tomorrow. That is actually true. It's tough. I've fired him several times. Yeah. It lasts for five to six seconds. You and fired him goes, before you even started this podcast. That is true. He yeah. just kind of stuck around. He knew. <laughs> yeah, I knew I would be needed. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm telling the truth. Like, I I love violence. I know, but I'm not a violent person. I know that as well. I like, I love nothing more than wrapping my arms around my kids and telling them that I love them. And it's like, they probably hate it at this point. Every time I see my kids, I give them a hug. Every time I see Julia at the coffee shop, I give her a hug. I, like every interaction I have with my kids, I tell them as many times to the point where their ears are probably bleeding that I love them. Right. Leah is probably 
utterly fucking annoyed by my desire to express affection towards her. Yeah, I, I have someone that's quite familiar. Let me tell you this, and I told Leah this today when we were up on the mountain. It's like when we were in, in that meeting yesterday, and you were talking about you and Leah shooting whatever. You lit up like a schoolgirl. Awesome. I was so I was just like, God, it was so cool to see that. But it, it's a true expression of joy and love and, and happiness. You know what I mean? And the fact that you get to experience that just from a friend standpoint makes me feel amazing. You know what I mean? It's like somebody else has what I have. I wish that for everybody. I truly yeah. do. But it ta- it starts with you. You have to you have to be healthy mentally and I, what I consider spiritually. And physical doesn't hurt either, you know what I mean? To optimize the... But then there's the other side of that, right? There's... Like, I feel like the way I feel is normal. I think all I think all human beings should be capable of violence. They have it in control. Jordan Peterson does a great job of talking about that. Yeah. You know what's interesting? And I was thinking about this the other day. Jordan Peterson talks about men, capable men being... They, they have a proficiency in violence, but they have it under control. Right. Do you think he is capable of violence in any way, shape, or form? Like an expert, a professional talking about this, about the role of violence, but then isn't capable of it himself. I, it, it would go one of two ways. You could either either punch through Jordan Peterson yeah. or you have stepped into a world where you have underestimated your opponent yeah. and he is on you like I feel like though if he rice. trained in any way, shape, or form, we would kind of know Does about he do it. jiu-jitsu? I don't know. And there's other shit out there besides jiu-jitsu. Well, you I need to have thought, striking, you know what I mean? Like yeah, stand-up, yeah, take like all that shit. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, I, can, yeah. I concur. However, I thought that he did. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's wild – to recognize in yourself how much you care for and value that as affection and your willingness to take what's on the inside of people's heads and put it on the outsides if they push you to that point. Yeah. It's a weird place to be. Well, it always has to be. <laughs> Fuck. It's at the, I mean, it's it's right there. But like you said, it's under control. And, and I'm not looking to exercise that. I'm looking for every reason not to. I don't. Yeah. Brian Callen asked me one time, he was talking about war. And he said, well, what are your thoughts on killing people then again i'm not so sure how this is going to come off but I'll, I'll give you the same answer that i gave him i said it's one of my absolute favorite things to do right and, and he looked at me and he said what the fuck is wrong with you and i said brian can you think it's not the act of physically taking a life I, to be honest with you again that's another one where the hollywood narrative has completely blown the lid off of that kettle it's just right first off you almost never have time to fucking think about it. You're like, ah, mm-hmm. surprise. Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, I'm not sitting there, twi- you know, oh, I'm going to watch you for seven days right. and get to know you. It's like, oh shit, you're standing behind that corner. Like, yeah. Fucker. Yeah. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. Because I can see at night and you can't, you son of a bitch, don't scare me like that. Yeah. Now I need new pants too. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, that's the fucking reality of it. But what other environment in there that has consequences that are so utterly and absolutely steeped that you get to go into that environment and find out who the fuck you actually are. Right. So it's not the it, and again, maybe my answer to him and even the way I just described it is imprecise to say the least. But I don't think you come out of that testing environment the same person that you go into it as. And I guess that's the value and that's what I enjoy from those or enjoyed from those situations because I'm not looking to do that again. Right. But I think people underestimate the willingness of people with our backgrounds to go back to that. Right. And it's not It's pretty. not a far cry. Well, and that's what I – I start bumping up against people who are calling for civil war in the streets. Jesus Christ. They will see you in the streets. It's like I really? don't want to do that. Yeah. And for clarity, neither do you. Right. right. Because the level of violence that that escalates to so quickly exceeds their wildest imagination. Mm-hmm. And Call of Duty on a video game is fun. I don't. I never found it to be that fun in real life. It's right. fun when you're winning. Right. It's not fun when you're tied and you're wondering whether or not you're going to win. Right. Right. So. Well, that's the thing. I, I my perspective on that or my shape, and I I talk about it from a behavioral health standpoint. Is I had to make peace that I would never be in absolute control of my entire environment yeah. and be that safe ever again. Like that's a tough one to, to come. I think it's the the inherent like search for power. Like 
in those moments, you are ultimately in control of everything in your environment. And that's a tough one to let go of. Yeah. Well, that's the locus of control again. That's not, that's why I asked you about that question. That was a test and you passed. It wasn't a test. Locus it's it's just, it, it reinforced what the psychiatrists and psychologists right. have talked to me. I've about. never heard. I'll have to read up on that. I've never locus L O U C S. No, L O C U S. I have an academic scholarship. It'd have been like Lokes, the Lokes of control. Locus of yeah, control. Yeah, you're, you're the you're the nerd alert. Obviously, I didn't know that before, but I'm a medical doctor. <sighs> this is not true. I don't know if I would enjoy being a medical doctor. I don't know. I actually had a kind of a. I don't know. I cross trained quite a bit with our deltas, uh, our medics. Yep. Not the mics. we sent our medics there too. Actually, yeah, yeah. delta short That's and right. long course. Yeah. Um, yeah, those guys are they really are like doctors like when the from, hydraulic fluid starts seeping a out trauma standpoint you want them there that's exactly who you want or pj mm -hmm. those dudes yeah, can PJs stop shit doctors as well right quick yeah yeah you guys you guys had corman mm -hmm. on white side and then the other guys for our corman on the conventional side still go to the six month delta course oh, okay you can become an idc which I think stands for independent duty, Corman. That's the addition of the long course okay. on top of that. Okay. Yeah. And I think there's some. Not level all of them don't go. No, to, it's not. It, okay. But, you know, the special operations, and now I'm a little bit over my skis because they changed this as I was mm -hmm. getting out. Being a SEAL is not of itself now an occupation, whereas it used to be you still had to right. take your test on whatever your job mm -hmm. was in the military. Right. I think at some point, if you want to advance and you are on the corpsman side of the house, you have to go to the IDC course. It might okay. be the jump from E6 to E7. I gotcha. So that's a chief, right? E7? Correct. E7 is a chief. I would, I would describe that as the jump from middle management. Yeah, I gotcha. Of course, as in the, ar the Army, you have two versions of an E4. That fucking threw me for a loop for a little bit. Yeah, I was both. Yeah, but why? Twice. Yeah, why, though? Why is there two E4s? I don't know. I think it, it stems from the old uh, technician kind of thing i have no idea one is considered an nco a junior nco mm -hmm. and the other is still an enlisted i have fun with that i don't make the rules nor do i and they don't ask me to either which is probably a wise call i would say so yeah yeah what uh how'd you know it was time to get out or did you just time out at your time? no i i asked to be they were gonna let me stay till 20 i asked to be retired at uh I got out at 19 years and two months and they were good. They, they were gracious enough to let me stay. But I was like, at that point being brutally honest, I was like, I don't think that I'll make it to that point. It things had gotten that bad, yeah. not just, not just from a career standpoint, but from, you know, a personal standpoint, there's so many things and all of which were my fault. Um, however, I was just like, I can't be in this environment anymore. Probably saved my life getting out. One of the things that saved my life getting out at that point. I mean, I'm assuming they medically retired you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was fully taken care of. I, prior to all of this, my reputation uh, within the, the unit and the community was my body of work kind of spoke for itself. I, I mean, I'm not bragging by any standpoint, yeah. but I was I was good. It at is that. what it is. I was, yeah. you know, up until that point where things started, the wheels started to fall. Had you even thought about what you were going to do when you got out? Wow, that's a that, no, not not in the least because frankly, that's fun, right? Yeah, I didn't think I was <laughs> like, but you know, that's where I was in a mental state. Like yeah. my mental state was like, I don't even know I'll be tomorrow, you know. So, um, but the thing of it being is like we talked about this quite a bit. It's like the programs, like why don't we start? And I know there are programs out there, but start something where these guys can monetize their network yeah monetize their skill sets you don't have to go into the defense industry you don't have to be a contractor you don't have to do any of those things like from an entrepreneurial standpoint there's so like a lot of the stuff that you did in your old job cross pollinates into this is just finding the right people to surround yourself and support yourself with um and that therein lies the difficult problem we we're talking about how, how hard it is to find good people to surround yourself with because they're becoming more rare because we're all reacting to things emotionally rather than approaching problems objectively so so where'd you land when you first got out what was your uh, first job i went back home i went back home and just tried to heal up lick my wounds um back to mississippi um and then mike actually gave me my first job i was an instructor for for field craft michael aubrey michael aubrey michael aubrey glover yeah also known as the quant. The quant. Somebody sent me an official. I saw the certificate. Quantitative certificate. Are you taking it to him? 
I sent, it to, I sent it to him digitally. I figured it was a faster way to get it in front of him. He was a fan. He sucks at math. I know. Horrible. Do you know he's Asian? Yeah. Fantastic driver. Stereotypically though. the opposite. Fantastic driver. Horrible at math. Doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I don't get him. Yeah. So worked for Mike for quite a few years. Yeah. A couple, two and a half years. When I worked from an instructor into the uh, training director position over there. And it was a great time. Made a lot of lot of good connections i don't it was great honestly like i i missed the absolute crap out of that crazy bastard i really do he's because it's the there's something about and we don't even talk about it that much so you don't but being with friends who understand where you have been before you know i think that that's super important but you have to be doing that healthily like you can't hang out with a guy that's like and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Do what you have to do. But if you're just drinking at the VFW for every single day of your life and you're not doing anything like, you know, let's take the successes that we have and build upon those, you know, perpetuate success between like between each other and support, you know, bounce ideas off of each other, have real conversations where we're not just talking about, you know, the old job. Yeah. Or, you know, I have to assume you guys had some crossover in your career. Where'd you guys first meet? Uh, so... At selection, Mike was which is the pre Q course, correct? Okay. Mike was Mike's bunk was directly across from mine. He was taking off his tomb marker patch, and I recognized the patch, and I was like, "Hey, are you tomb marker?" And he's like, "Yeah," and kind of talked to me a little bit about that. And we had our first conversation. I was like, "I had no idea how big of a deal that was inside of the army. Huge deal. I had no huge idea. Huge honor. Yeah. Um, but I was like, "Well, you know, right on, man. Good luck." And then. During land navigation, all the events, uh, Mike and I would kind of show up first or second. You know, I would always beat him. Of course. He would be I mean, second. that was the assumption that I operated. Right, 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 right. You've seen our elk in the coffee shop. One is slightly larger than the other. Right, right. People, so, can, people can fill that in and figure out who this is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we crossed paths throughout our career a few times and, uh, you know, shot the USAC sniper competition, which he always is like, yeah, and we – beat you that and i'm like mike here here the results those are just that's historical data you yeah. can't just say and make things up um, i don't know if he operates under that principle that's a good point he it is <laughs> it is mike's reality i have heard him say some wild shit i'm like i don't know if that's true but i'm not going to challenge you on that but right he now. says it with conviction correct so, he sells it he pff, boy i'm telling you what yeah no um but he gave me he gave me my first job and that, that was did you guys stay in kind of was like close contact or you guys would kind of just balloon back. Yeah. We were just, once yeah. In a while. Bounce back into each other every once yeah. in a while throughout our, you know, throughout our career. Um, but like I said, he was gracious enough to give me a job and it really, that job helped fill the service gap for me. I got to be with like-minded people, um, met some phenomenal people throughout that process as well. It was, it was really, I don't know. It was divine timing for me, honestly, it kept me healthy and, you know, and it's gotten me to this point now. So yeah. super grateful for that. And then recently, I don't know, within what, like the last six months, you yeah. switched over to a new venture. Yes, sir. Cloud turning, defensive. Cur- turning the night into day. Yeah. Visible spectrum light. Do they do any IR stuff? Not yet. I'm pushing them that direction, though. Matt's going to yell at me about that, but I'm going to try and do it. I mean, it's super helpful, assuming you have night vision goggles. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Otherwise, like, this lies, shit doesn't work. Therein lies the issue. Um, no, really, uh, really innovative company. They're a young company. I met Matt three, four years ago. Mm-hmm. They had five employees. Now they have over 50. They 5X'd in five years. Um, That's a pretty good growth curve. In in that industry, especially, you know. Um, but we've got some stuff coming up uh, shortly after SHOT Show. I feel like it's going to blow the lid off of things. So really good people. Um, everything's American made. You know, good principles, good values. Um, Do they have a light that goes under the 365 well pistol light? You're asking about an EPL. So there's a running joke. Whatever you just said, I have no idea what that means. But Well, so the running joke is this light has been in development for quite some time, and I'm probably going to get in trouble talking about this. But Tell me more. Yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> please continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's coming within the next within the next six months. It's coming, and everyone is waiting. So anytime that. Uh, cloud defensive posts anything on uh, 
on social media or, or YouTube or whatever, the comments, look in the comments section, you'll just see EPL question mark. Wednesday. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a it's a run and drug custody. I say that to say they know that it's going to be the one just because highest outputs on the individual spectrum on the market. The light, it, the product itself is the highest output. It it sells itself. It's like if you want to, and you, it's easy to test. You can take Light X and yeah, one of our products. Yes, and it's, it's not like, subjective. It's right. very objective. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely very biased towards Sig because that was kind of the pistol right, right. platform that we grew up on and. I love the 365. Um, I think I'm running the XL macro. Or it's whatever. Is it, is. it the, yeah. In the fanny pack, 17 plus one, which is insane for that size. For I a love pistol. that macro. But half of the day is not day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Can you, can, can, half of the day is not day. Half of the day is not day. That is a scientific fact. It is. Yeah. And Unless you bad live, stuff. Unless you live up here in the winter, and then three quarters of the day right. is not day. I know. <laughs> Eric and I were talking about that last night. It's like the sun doesn't come up till like eight o'clock, and it goes down at three thirty. You can fool here. yourself. You'd lay in bed like, oh, I can still sleep in some more. The sun's not up. It's. I mean, it's nine thirty. Yeah, but <laughs> we should probably get up. <laughs> summertime. It doesn't go down to like eleven here. So. My uh, productivity peaks in the summer months. I would say so. Yeah. And my nesting slash uh, sleepy time peaks in the winter months. <laughs> so you're like a bear. Are you? I don't know. In that right? I don't know much about bears. Well, how's your vitamin D, bro? <sighs> the, Do we want to venture down that? No, we can't. I'm trying to think of the way because I, I have talked to you about this, mm-hmm. and uh, I I'm trying to think of the way I find. So I have a few friends. We all have friends. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I hate the fucking term operator syndrome. Not the syndrome part. I, I, I just don't like the term operator, and I don't know why. Um, but there are some medical issues mm-hmm. that do not broadly apply. Some people more susceptible than others. And again, it's like from a genetic perspective, too. You might have had good parents, and, you know, Evan Hafers could walk under this table without crouching down. You know what I mean? Like, genetically, not everybody wins the lottery. He would just walk straight through, and this table is about a foot and a half off the ground. For those of you out there on the shorter bus, I'm saying he's short. Right. You know, short mm-hmm. bus. See what I did there? Short bus, short. It's I like a it. Deal. Nice connection. You're an well, academic well. scholar, so, I mean, obviously, you got it immediately. <laughs> um, and I just turned 46 years old, and I have been getting to a place where, dude, I, I will wake up feeling exhausted. My recovery at jujitsu, which is one of my favorite activities, more from a puzzle problem solving perspective yeah, than the physical. Of course. Again, I'm not looking for, I am not looking to fucking hurt somebody on the mats. I actually, it is my absolute worst nightmare that I would absolutely, that I would accidentally hurt somebody or intentionally hurt somebody because I lost emotional control. Right. Like recovery is slow, brain fog at times. It's just my body was feeling off. Mm-hmm. And I finally went and got a full panel of blood work done. Buddy, um, uh, Six months ago, the last time I was, maybe it was a year ago, I don't know. The last time I went to Austin to go beyond Joe's show, a yeah. guy reached out. His name's Chris Williamson. He hosts the podcast, uh, the Modern Wisdom Podcast. Okay. He made a post, and uh, and I and I'm not trying to make this an ad by any stretch. What I want to do, and my goal moving forward with this, is I want to be completely open, honest, and transparent about what led up to it, where I'm at, and what I'm trying to achieve. Right, Chris did a social media post that said, hey, I just started working with a company called Merrick Health about six months ago. And he's like, I'm not on TRT, but I had a full panel of blood work done. And he talked about his testosterone numbers and what they were able to naturally, they were attacking the mechanisms inside of his body that naturally produced testosterone. One of the things with operator uh, symptom that I've now educated myself on and talking with people is that oftentimes the natural regulatory systems, whether it's explosive blast, concussive way, whatever it is, they're fritzed out Mm -hmm. to use a technical term. Right. That I think it's actually medical. I think it's in the seventh or eighth year of medical school. Mm -hmm. Should you make it that far? Yeah. Meaning you might have less effect by actually targeting in that way. Mm -hmm. And I text him. I'm like, dude, tell me about what you're talking about. He's younger than me, but I'm like, this is how old I am. Like, this is how I'm feeling is the post you put up, like, is it legit? And he wrote back, on, he's like, dude, they're awesome. Let me connect you with them. Mm-hmm. So he connected me with a guy at Merrick Health. It starts with a blood draw. Mm-hmm. And I don't, if I'm being totally honest, 
I think I avoided. I know I had blood draws in the military for like your annual, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I don't actually ever remember like the testosterone in, in addition to the other stuff that they tested me for. But I think I subconsciously avoided having anything checked I, absolutely. for a long time. It's like, yeah, yeah I know maybe like I'm, I'm catching some warning signs, but how good did we get at our old job at being comfortable, being slightly uncomfortable? That's And this cascading, like it's a little, it's like 1% worse this week, but I can turn that into my new baseline. Right, right. 52 fucking weeks down the road, your new baseline is half, you know right. what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I'm with you. So he was like, dude, they're legit. They did not advocate that I get on TRT. They wanted me to attack these things naturally first. Like his numbers like tripled. Mm-hmm. So I get a hold of him. First thing is the blood draw. And I go down and I, God, I think they almost suck me dry. I know. Right? I'm like, all the, shit. all the files. Yeah. It's like, are we done? Yet? Thankfully it was just one stick, you know? Yeah. And, um, but literally, I'm like, do I need to have like a banana and some orange juice after this? Cause you I'm guys just dr- let me drive? Yeah, I need to drive home. Should I let my dad drive? That might be more dangerous because he went <laughs> sort of random days like, oh, I'll drive down to Missoula with you. I'm like, do you not have anything else to do today? I mean, but like, totally come with me. And it was actually cool because I had a chance to talk to him about it. Um, God, and we had such an awkward conversation because he was, you know, he's like, testosterone. And he's, he's like, you know. At my age, I just care about sex a lot less. But maybe I need some more of that testosterone. I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, Dad. No, <laughs> no. no. I don't have yeah, this. Dude. I'm like, God damn it, man. So we go down. The blood draw comes back in about a week. Mm. And after that, there is a consultation with somebody who's not a doctor, but it kind of gives you the baseline right. results. But they give you the results. Frightening, huh? I read it. I read it in an afternoon and I didn't know how to talk to Leah about it. I slept on it that night and the next morning, I think it was a Saturday, a day where she didn't have to get up uh, and go to work. We just had time to kind of like a slow on ramp to our morning. And I said to her, I said, hey, so I had my blood work done. I told her I was going to go down there and do it, obviously. What I said was I had the results came back. And uh, I'm sick to my stomach because they put it up on a – it was like red, yellow, green. Yeah, eighty percent of the numbers were in the red, of course, and not not like the the edge between red and yellow. Like yeah. it was red. My my testosterone was barely three hundred, and my and I know that there's two different. There's like serum or free or something like that. I mean, I, I'm actually tempted to pull the the report up and go through it, but like we don't need to get that deep into yeah. my personal medical details. Yeah. It is that you or me? That's you. I mean, I knew better than to leave my phone on. It's fine. It's not my first rodeo. Um, it's kind of your thing. Dude, nauseous. Like, it, it made me sick to my stomach. And I think it made me sick to my stomach because I had the realization that I knew. It's like I had to confront the fact that I yeah. probably could have gotten that tested a while ago. Yeah. So I'm still at a point where I haven't done shit. Yeah. Because there are other requirements but i sat and we went through an hour and i think we probably for an hour with the in a consult, consultation we must have covered 50 to 80 metrics mm-hmm. and i just and i'm taking notes and you ask me about vitamin d holy shit it would appear as if i'd never go into right. the sun ever like i don't that that particular metric actually was probably the lowest in the red of any of them and they're mm-hmm. you know educating me on it like this is a hormonally governing vitamin right so, and the, looking at my paperwork, absent the individual knowing anything about my military career or operational history, he asked me, he said, do you have any injury of concussions or mm-hmm. blast exposure? And I said, why do you ask? And he said, your numbers, what I'm looking at, and I'm not a doctor and we'll leave it up to the doctor, but I've done this enough now are indicating to me that there might be a dysregulation between your normal systems specifically around testosterone and what's going on in your body. And it may not actually benefit you to try to attack those things because right. it might not have the impact that you want it to. So I'm in a phase now. I'm waiting to do the telehealth conversation with the doctor. Right. But it is very likely that I will go down a path that will incru- include TRT or testosterone replacement therapy. I think that's what it stands for. Right. In addition to probably a handful of other supplements at the same time because right. there were so many numbers that were low associated with that so that's a really long-winded answer to say my vitamin d fucking sucks right well i mean i it, wish i wouldn't have put it off for so long and there's also this really weird the reason i wanted that i'm even willing to talk about it is 
I want to be able to be transparent. And there's this weird stigmatism of people that for like for me, I'm 46. Right. I'm looking at the amount of sound that's left in an hourglass. Mm -hmm. There is more in the bottom than there is at the top. And that's okay. I mean, I I guess I could make it to 92. I don't know if I want to make it to 92. Like what kind of cool shit are you doing at 92? Yeah. You know, you're eating your daily jello ration out of some other dude's asshole. I mean, I don't know what they do in nursing homes. That's the first thing that came to mind, but uh, it happens. It happens. Oh, I know. I'm well aware. <laughs> Michael, you're over there. It's like, it's a possibility, right? I guess. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever heard of it. You've never volunteered at a nursing home and seen this? Yeah. No. I kind of want to now. If there is a nursing home where this is happening, I'll provide you Michael's personal contact information if you hit me up. But I, I'm at a place where I need to do something, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to educate myself as much as possible. And I just, I'm going to be completely fucking open and honest with my entire reason. What led me to this, what I'm looking at doing. I don't have the call with the telehealth professional until late, late in this month, any type of interventions or treatment or therapy wouldn't happen until January, Mm. but I would so much rather destroy the stigmatism associated with it. Right. So people, if that is a viable option for them, and I don't know what the doctor's going to say. I'm pretty sure what I know he's going to say, right. at least when it comes to the testosterone route. But it's also, I'm not trying to be like a competitive fucking bodybuilder yeah, or of course. jacked on steroids. Like I, I would actually just like to feel normal. Right. Well, so, that's the thing. So I, my vitamin D sucks. I was yeah. like fucking 30 minute explanation on vitamin D. No, no, well, I mean, that's the thing. It's like the mechanism is compromised in order for you to maintain the proper level. So yeah. you're doing something about it. And it's not for, like you said, like, I don't want to be a bodybuilder, but I, the, but so I am currently taking TRT. The What got you to that point? The same thing. I got my testosterone tested. I was, uh, I was at 240. So I was essentially, you know, like a 14 year old girl has more testosterone that's what than that. Exactly. So, I mean, that's kind of frightening. And with that, you know, a lot of other issues is, um, from, I noticed like I couldn't, no matter what I was doing diet wise, I couldn't lose yeah. weight, you know, all those things. And, and it wasn't, let me make it clear that it wasn't an aesthetic stimulus to seek this out. It was like cognitive function was terrible. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't recover. You know, nothing was was going the way that, and I, I haven't gone to the depths of looking at, you know, hormones and, and all of those things, but I was just like, Hey, what are my options? And they're like, well, we can do this. And same thing. They were like, Hey, we can, you know, there's peptides, there's, there's hormone replacement therapy. There's this, that, and the other, and found a dose that works for me. And it's like, I can think I can sleep, I can recover. Um, it's, it's just, optimizing what I do have left yeah. in order to be there for my family. That's it. How long after starting the treatment did you feel a difference? Probably about a about a month, I would say. About a month I started noticing things. I was like, man, I'm thinking really clearly. My my memories, believe it or not, my memory was actually more functional. My short term memory was absolute crap. And it still is, don't get me wrong. Um but it got better and I like noticeably to the point where I was like, well, I'm thinking better. Yeah. You know, and I didn't associate it with the, with the TRT at the time. I was just like, what's going on? And I was like, Oh yeah, this is also a benefit of it. Um, yeah. I'm interested in the minimum amount of intervention possible to try to get me back to where I feel fucking normal. Right. Like a human being. Right. I know there are people and I, and I think it would be, um, irresponsible of us to not acknowledge that there are people who abuse, that type of stuff. Right. And there are, my experience with Merrick so far has been awesome. Um, and what I, what I can say so far with my experience is they are the opposite of an organization that you could call up and try to say, Hey, this is what I'm looking at doing. They'd be like, get the fuck out of here. Right. 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 But there are things like that that do exist so far. It's been great. Right. Yeah. I I don't know. It's, it's been life changing for me. It's, it's like once I got my head in the right place. And I was like, okay, well let's start addressing these problem sets, you know, be, you know, for all aspects of my life, you know, and I'm finally to a place where it's just like, wow, this, this is pretty, pretty rad ride. You know what I mean? So now you can start training jujitsu. You blue belt, you, I'm not a blue belt. You wore a blue belt the other night. I have a picture. Don't who gave you these pictures? You said, I was like, hey, I don't even have a belt. And you're like, just put that blue one on. I know, but I was trying to set you up because I was hoping to get a picture so I could say it's stolen valor. <laughs> <laughs> and this, ladies and blue gentlemen. Belt, stolen valor. I have one. Erica took one of you 
uh, I think you you were attempting at. A, I don't know. You had my back or something, and you gave me your back. I didn't have your back. It's not my fault. You turned over like a possum. Are we having this having this conversation right now. <laughs> but it's a great picture because we're both literally giggling like yeah. schoolgirls. It, it's but it was so fun. I, I I'm I'm hooked again. I'm gonna stick with it. It's, I love it so much. And like you I, are you're made of dark matter. You're the heaviest human being on earth. I am not. I'm gonna introduce you to a man named Henry Akins. Yeah, and you will. You told me about that. That's Dan's guy, right? Find yeah. Dan is also heavy. You will find if you're not religious, you will find religion and pray to a variety of gods to get that man off of you. Yeah. Michael, was, have you had the bespoke experience of a role with one Henry Akins yet? Nope. I should go find like a 300 pound stone and just drop it on him from like five feet because that's about what it feels like. His told, ability. I'm trying to think of something like it's. All of his weight on something the size of that really? t- tip of a pin, which costs him nothing. And you are drowning on dry land underneath him. That's scary. I, t- I uh, told Leah, I was like, yeah, uh, I was like, Andy was talking about linking me up with Henry when I'm out in Vegas. She's like, oh, he doesn't train with, with white belts. You're a blue belt. <laughs> I'll send him the picture. That's your, yeah. your profile picture yeah. for me in the phone. He's like, you'll have to go with AG or something. I was like, I'll do that, man. Henry worked with me when I was a white belt. He, he would work with you. Okay. Well, we'll see. Uh-oh. The joy I have in that activity, and that's what piqued my att- – I'm like, I can't recover. Yeah. And you, if you think about it, the more you do it, as with anything, you're going to develop efficiencies. So you should right. actually be exerting probably less the longer you're into yeah. it. Like when you first start doing jiu-jitsu, it is the most physically – exerting activity for about 60 seconds until you absolutely until gas yourself. Yeah. yeah. After, I think I've been at it for just over five years at this point, you should have some levels of efficiencies. And when your body is, I'm like not recovering and I'm noticing a difference from when I first started. Mm-hmm. That's really what levered me over the edge. Like, okay, I cannot ignore this anymore. Right. I, so, I, we'll see. I don't know. The last time that I ventured into that space, I was not on the uh, it was not on TRT, and I felt like I was like, I, I can't. How can I do that again today? Yeah. But you know, we've rolled what two, three, two days now, mm-hmm. and let's. Are we still going after this? If you want to, yeah. Michael, Absolutely. did you get a chance to roll with Casey yesterday? Uh, I no, I don't that. think so. Uh-uh. He, there are people in every gym, and there's a lot of. He's different... a gray man back against the wall. No, they're called Mad Dodgers, and there's a variety of terms. Um, but what it means is he will only pick and choose the people to roll with that he feels like he wants to do a guitar solo. You know, he wants it to be. <laughs> he up wants there to show off his technique, yeah, and just like tap dancing and and he. If he thinks that you're not going to be able to provide that platform for him, he'll move on to the next. Matt Dodger. That's why I roll with you every time. <laughs> it's not, you, it's I a nightmare. I can tell you his game, 100% of all. He has tried the same pass on me 500 times, I think, probably. Like, legitimately 500 times. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> God, I deeply appreciate that. Yeah, it's never worked a single time, but yeah, yeah. So, but it ain't broke, is it? Yeah, so, exactly. There you go. We definitely can go train. I have to check in with the better halves. Same. I gotta to go see because I think we're doing a dinner of some kind. Oh yeah, we got that. We got. What time is the dinner? Six thirty. Six thirty. Yes, sir. Michael, do you fancy a little bit of training after this? Yeah, sounds good. Boom. That's what he says to people. He's like, I'll roll with you next. He will not show up there. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> like, I got stuck in the studio. I had to do well, some like, editing Well, like, park right behind stuff. each other. We'll pull up to a light. We'll go right. And it's like, did Michael just go left? Where's he going? <laughs> yeah, I, gotta, I had to go take care of All right. Well, then we're going to knock this off in 18 minutes. So we give ourselves time to train. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought up the health stuff because it, it's not something that I'm like – super stoked to talk about. I'm not proud mm. of the fact that I delayed it for a long period of time, mm. but I, I just am going to be open and honest about my experience on it. I think, uh, I think that we, we should, because I mean, a lot of guys that don't know what's wrong with them, they, they would know if it wasn't for this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe this is the first time some that There's people need to address that. fuck ton wrong with me more than testosterone. If you look at those metrics, like there are so many mechanisms that I am going to need to attack to include Probably better sleep hygiene, more regimented control. There's a dietary aspect of that, a supplement Absolutely. aspect of that. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I'm tempted to flip open the, the computer and just be like, this, this. It's like, right. 
Just imagine almost eight out of ten things that could be measured I'm aren't doing you. great. I know. I was there. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel, um, yeah, it's it's drastically improved my life um, in all aspects. So um, I'm an advocate, advocate for it, um, and I encourage people to take a look. Like, just go get a panel done. It's not yeah. that expensive. Just f- for nothing else, then you're going to have, you're going to know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something you can look at from an optimization standpoint. What are you uh what are you the most excited about in your life right now? Oh, wow. Um I'm excited about uh I'm excited about my position at Cloud. Um we have a lot of stuff coming up. Um I love where I'm at in my relationship with my wife. Um How long have you guys been married now? Almost two years. Yeah. Okay. So uh but it's like a honeymoon every single day. I mean we you know just we, because she's going to listen to this doesn't mean you have to say No, no, no. It. It's the thing. I, I The thing that I'm most proud of is like how we handle the hard things. Yeah. We are able to have the conversations necessary uh, to navigate those things together as opposed to creating divides in the relationship and fissures and all those things. We stay parallel efforts continuously. Easy days are just that. They're easy days. That's right. not who you find out who you are. Yeah. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I truly found my person you know yeah i it's, feel the same way with Leah. yeah i know and it shows too you know it, you, you can absolutely see it so i don't know i'm happy for you man do you think that you will at some point in time venture out on and, and i say this just pure curiosity because i know plenty of people who have worked for others their whole life and some people who have ventured out on their own and i'm not it's not to put a judgment on that right you think you'll ever do go out and spread your wings and just completely create your own ecosystem um, I'm actually considering that now. I just don't know the avenue of approach currently. I, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking about becoming an author. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking about, I have another venture that, you know, kind of addressing some of the problems we were talking about from a veteran space. And I know there's that, that pool is, is highly diluted. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the network and resources that I have access to, I feel like that I could be helpful in that space. Like what do you think you want to write about? Um, just the, uh, I would like to write about the body of work that I've done and how it affected me, but write it from a personal standpoint, talking about from a morality, like the foundation of the person that I was prior to exposure to all of that, like writing that story. And it's going to be difficult. I know that. Um, that's why I've kind of put it off for mm-hmm. a little bit, but it's going to be an exercise in honesty and vulnerability, which I feel like is absolutely necessary when talking about those things, taking ownership of all of those mistakes, um, talking about the the fear and talking about the anxiety and talking about all of those things that are counterintuitive to the, the person that, or the, the persona that is required to do that job. And then facing the reality of it in the end is just talking about, well, I have, there's two, two directions I can go continue living this way or I can write the shit. So I, I chose to write the shit. Out of all the stuff you've experienced in your life, what are you scared of the most? What am I scared of the most? I would venture to say becoming the person I was again. Uh, the behaviors that led to that and some, you know, fed that, like, I don't have a problem with, like, I don't drink anymore. I've been sober uh, for a long time. And I think the, if I ever chose to, to do that again, I know where it would end up. Mm-hmm. So I'm vigilant about that. Um, I take responsibility and ownership of that, and of that tendency. Um, and to ever think that it's okay to do that for me personally, I'm not saying anybody else, but yeah. I know where that would send me. Uh, so I'm um, that that would probably be it. Like if I I don't want that anymore because my life literally did a 180 when I sat the bottle down and started thinking through things objectively, and my life just began to incrementally improve. You know, what was the drink of choice? Uh, I was a huge fan of Jack Daniel's whiskey. Huge fan of gin for some reason because I my Did you ever inner combine the two. 
No. Jack and Jen? Jack and Jen. I'm no. not saying you should. I'm just asking. No. <laughs> there was probably a time. That would be it. fucking gross. And then Vatica's. The vodka? Yeah. Hell yeah. That was the... Burns clean. <sighs> Man, I tell you. Boatloads. Boatloads yeah. of that stuff. Don't miss it at all. I, I truly don't. Um, that was one of the things that Ibogaine did for me. It was just like, it literally took away my desire to to drink. I was just like, when I put it down, it was just like, okay, decision made, done. That was it. Michael, you're like half our age. What are you scared of the most? You're at a different phase of your life. Heights. Jesus Can Christ. we get slightly more existential than that, you know? Because <laughs> um, that's like completely <clears throat> avoidable. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, God, he's probably too young to even think about things. He doesn't have any fear yet. I I don't know. I I am kind of scared of like colossally fucking up and really. Define that. Making a decision that will basically mm, put the trajectory of my life on a downward spiral that will be very, very hard to get out of. You're talking about meth, Michael? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they say well not even once but it felt really good the first time so i mean i'm gonna give you some controversial advice i think there's not that i think people should try to do this i know where this is going but i think you should make some decisions that might put you in a place where you catastrophically fuck up so you can fight your way out of it mm-hmm. right now yeah like right now if i had to pick one thing I would say in our social circle and in the gym, you're probably defined as being a pussy. (laughs) Right? Do you see how he delivered that? It was just like real. I I thought it was going to be inspirational for a second. No, 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 no. 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 Just insulting. I'm inspiring you right now. Let me (laughs) finish. Oh, thank you. That's what we think of you now. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What can you do to change that? (laughs) You need to be risky. You You need to be risky. risky. (laughs) You are at the phase of your life that Casey and I have already passed through. And uh, you know one of my least favorite questions for young men and women is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Jeez, you have no idea. You know what I've come to realize? A lot of people don't know how to talk to kids. It's, it's, it's more like an awkward conversation thing. They, you know, like, what's your favorite color? What's your, you know, they just, they a don't lot, know to, they A don't lot of people don't know how to communicate, period, anymore. Well, and you get them around, like, so they struggle with adults and they get them around kids and they're like, hello, German Shepherd. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. a child. Yeah, I'm with you. But- if you think about it from a logical perspective where you have the most opportunity to recover, think about the time and the amount of time you have left in your life to recover from uh, – and I'm not saying you should go do something stupid to fuck your life up. And then justify it with this conversation if you do. Yeah. Well, Andy said. <laughs> but think about how much time you have in your life to course correct or to work on the resilience. Like risk I, – I, I am always willing to take risks. I'm never willing to gamble. There's a, and there's a huge difference mm-hmm. between those two. But at a younger age, you have more opportunity to risk more than any of us. Like right. my risk tolerance and threshold should be lower. Three kids, a bit, you know what I mean? Like there's mm-hmm. you, again, what you just have is what you're known for everywhere. Being by a everyone. Pussy. Yes. <laughs> so we need to work on that. I, I told like, a guy in the airport, young kid, uh, real estate, and he was in real estate and whatnot. And he's like, well, I could do this, but I'll be broke. I was like, be broke. Seriously. I was like, brother, be broke. I was like, I That's learned a more. That's solvable problem. Yeah, yeah. And it's it doesn't have to be on a continuum. I was like, spend some time broke. Yeah. It's like you will learn so much from that. Be an E four, paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> Get some. Those spend two thirds, if not three quarters, of your paycheck on an apartment you can't afford that you eat ramen in. Yeah, and you live with three <laughs> other your of your buddies totally. that are paying the same amount. Yeah, you know what I realized? I had an apartment for a year and a half in uh, Coronado. The first time I had one, I didn't own a vacuum. Hell and I yeah. think back, I'm like, son of a bitch. Hell yeah. COVID-19 was started right there. In the apartment. <laughs> yeah. In that, in that contractor carpet. God. God, they should have taken a flamethrower to that place when we moved out. Who the Man. fuck doesn't vacuum their floor for a year and a half? I mean, let me tell you. Right here. <laughs> this guy right here? Yeah, this is like maybe 20. And my buddies. Yeah. Do you don't vacuum floor? You have so much room in front of you, man. There's stuff that you're messing up right now that you don't even know you're messing up, which is awesome. Most of it I'll let you know because I enjoy yeah, it. It's, he a, it's will. a pastime and hobby of mine. But I really enjoyed your guys' podcast, too. That's a, that's a, he claims he's got a bunch of questions loaded up, so maybe I have, we'll do it next week. Yeah, yeah, I have quite a few. The first I'm time ready. we sat down to do it, he goes, oh, I misunderstood. <laughs> I don't have any questions. I thought I was just going to be reading them to you. 
Like, I thought I was gonna be reading the audience questions. God. <laughs> it's like children. Did you fire him again? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I tell you what, the weapon he is now. I mean, if we were to describe him as a weapon, he'd still be made out of rubber, right? <laughs> when I first met him, it was, I don't know, putty, Play-Doh. Mm. At least at this point, he's like a semi-rigid dildo just flopping all over the place, right? But <laughs> yeah. like, that's we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, improvement. it's improvement for sure. Yeah. He's that's taking good. shape. Yeah. We're going to mold him. Gaining in. stature. Here's the thing. Can you imagine the weapon we could mold him into? Like, the world would not be ready to for what we could do to him. Bro. Yeah. An, ass- an assassin. Yeah. We could create an assassin. E- even off that, assassin. Even off that yeah. platform. Yeah. You could be a assassin. <laughs> <laughs> I already assassinate pussy, if you or, know what I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> you could be an assassipus. Assassipus. <laughs> that's, I think that's kind of fitting. Assassipus. We oh, both I- know that you're not a, an assassin of pussy. All right. We've talked many times about how you've given up on the dating game. So... You don't have to date to slay pussy. <laughs> I guess. I feel like he's named his right hand pussy, but <laughs> I'm not jealous of that game, bro. So no. you enjoy yourself out there. No. You'll find your person, man. Yeah. Eventually. Possibly. I didn't find my person until I was in my forties. That's Same. true. Same. You know. Yeah. And uh there was a lot of ups and downs along the way and a lot of times of happiness and absolute suffering. And the vast majority of those were my own fault, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't give up a second of that to give up, you know, to change what I have with Leah. Right. It takes time, man. I would yeah. experience every single bit of that a thousand times over to be where I am. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Truly blessed. Lucky. What do you think, Assassipus? Should we uh, go get some training? And that's actually, I'm just going to call him that. For you should write it on the back of his belt. Assassipus. I mean, he has names like Bottom Bunk, like all sorts yeah. of. Very- Assassipus versus the Cuckler. You roll with Tyler. How's that go? I mean, I win, but you should win. You're a purple belt. Yeah. He also hasn't found his man strength yet. He's like still no, he's he, like bendy. He's, when he's he does, there, but when he does, yeah, dude, yeah, okay. it'll be he'll be the assassin, and you can be the assassin puss. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knows what that battle dynamic looks like. duo. Probably like a nuclear bomb. Just I'm picturing Godzilla and Mothra kind of thing. Can you imagine mm-hmm. finding jujitsu when you were 17? Oh my, my god. god. Dude. I or know. actually, in this in the modern era, there are people whose parents own gyms. They grew up and developed their movement patterns on the mat. And it, you'd like to compare it to languages. We're not even talking the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think I understand the alphabet, but um, I don't understand yeah. what what's happening. He's, like, creating code, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. What do you want to close out with? It's been like over two hours, actually. We should go get some training in before we... Uh, we should. Did you get invited to uh, to dinner tonight? Nope. Yeah, that's weird. You're still not. But just, mm, what do you want to close out with? Uh, I don't know. Gratitude, I guess. All right. Very Sorry. fortune cookie. What, you got anything else? No. Uh, no, I'm just grateful for, grateful for my friend circle. I'm grateful for where I am in life. Grateful for my family. You know, um, and I'm grateful for the people that gave me the opportunities to get to this spot, and the ones that believed in me even when I was in the the worst of places. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. So thanks. Thankful for that. And thanks for this opportunity. Cool. Oh, I always enjoy hanging out with you. Yeah, man. Likewise. Cheers. It'll be cool. I'm glad you guys are coming down to uh, Salt Lake with us. Yeah. Train a little bit with uh, Mr. Glover. Actually, I'm actually not going to allow him to train because he just had neck surgery. Yeah, he's not going to train. He can't train. Dude, I saw a picture of him in a gi and he had the scar on his I neck. I saw it. And I'm like, hey, man, that's a scar on your neck from neck surgery that was four weeks ago. You can't tell what him What are anything. you doing? You can't tell him anything. He's not going to listen. It might have just been a picture, though. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. All right. On that note, let's go train. Let's do it. Let's do it.